Hey there, folks. Mike here. Tom here as well. Kyle here as well. Uh, if you look at your podcast feed, you uh, saw this episode title, you might have noticed that there's no guest for this episode. You might have also noticed that it says commentary track or some such variation, which really from those two things alone, deductive reasoning ought to make clear what this is. But nevertheless, here's a quick explainer. Uh, we wanted to try something a little bit different for this episode on Eric von Stroheim's 1924 masterwork, Greed. You know, only 12 people ever saw von Stroheim's original eight-hour cut of Greed before the studio hacked it down. And likely, only avid cinephiles have sought out the four-hour reconstruction cut that Turner put together in 1999 using stills of some of the deleted scenes. And compared to the other canonical classics we're covering this season, the number of people who have seen the existing theatrical cut is probably pretty small. And even less than all of those people is the number of people who know that this podcast has a YouTube channel. Uh, I'm one of them. When did, when did this happen? And while we can't restore Greed to its original eight-hour length and show that, we can rectify those final two groups I just mentioned. Because for this episode, we're not just going to have an aimless hour-long discussion with a guest that jumps all over the place story-wise. Instead, this episode is going to go through the film from start to finish as a commentary track. We'll let you know as soon as we hit start and begin remarking on Eric von Stroheim's silent classic for the full runtime, and still make time for our registry picks at the end. Of course, you can listen to this track on its own on your commute or at the gym or wherever you listen to this show, but should you find yourself unwilling to indulge in commentary without accompanying images, we've got you covered. Because on our show's YouTube page, you can watch the exact same theatrical cut of Greed we're watching with this commentary track synced up with it. Unless that's already how you're hearing this, in which case, good job. For everybody else, just go to youtube.com slash at YMO podcast to find the video. We'll also put it in our show notes. And if you're thinking, I'd rather just watch the movie without the commentary, you know, there's a mute button, so you're all set. Uh, this is new for us, uh, commentary tracks, so there may be some hiccups here and there. Forgive us those. And please let us know if you like this format. If the reception is positive, we'll try and do more of these in future seasons and sync them up with the films. So without further ado, let's hear what the Library of Congress had to say about greed, and then start the picture. Here's what the National Film Registry had to say. Eric von Stroheim's Greed chronicles the downfall of gold miner turned dentist McTeague, gives him Goland, and his wife, Trina, Zazu Pitts, after their lives are destroyed by greed following a lottery win. Based on the novel McTeague by Frank Norris, Greed is notorious for both its production difficulties, many of which stemmed from the fact that the film was shot on location, a rarity at the time, and its post-production, which MGM edited the film down against von Stroheim's wishes, from his initial 40-reel cut to about 13 reels, or 133 minutes. The cut sequences were destroyed, so no complete version of the film is known to exist. A 1999 reconstruction based on von Stroheim's final working script utilized still photos for the missing sequences to create a 239-minute version. That is what the National Film Registry had to say. As for what we had to say, uh, well, we're going to start saying it. Synced up with the film. So if you guys are watching along, you can uh, hit play in three, two, one. Boom, we've hit play. Follow along, fuckers. Let's go. Greed. So here's here's an interesting thing from the start is I want to talk about this lion. I'm dead serious. I have facts about this lion. Yeah, which of, lion is this? Of, of how course. is this lion number four, number five? Like how many lions? Kyle, did you do lion MGM? research too? No, I just know that there have been multiple There have indeed been lions, so we're already passing, but I'm gonna talk about them anyway. Uh, this was I believe the third lion, right? This oh. lion, I believe its original name they called them all Leo, but uh, in right fact his, his name was Slats. It was the third MGM lion who made his debut on uh, He Who Gets Slapped earlier this year in 1924, which uh, He Who Gets Slapped also in the registry. Slats died in 1936 when he was 17. At that time, uh, he was uh, retired in a farm in Gillette, New Jersey, uh, and was buried with a statue uh, that is still standing in New Jersey today. Uh, also, earlier, we saw June Mathis' name on this script as one of the co-writers. Uh, June Mathis is best remembered for discovering Rudolph Valentino and wrote uh, the film Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which, again, is also in the registry. From the American classic. That's true. This credits it as an American classic by Frank Norris, which is not necessarily the case anymore. I don't think anybody... Most people don't read McTeague, and I think Frank Norris has really fallen out of fashion. Um... They never chuckled with McTeague. <laughs> uh, he's fallen out of fashion, I think, because at the even at the time, I think he was kind of viewed as an imitator of Emile Zola, and Emile Zola's kind of naturalist 
literary style. Uh, Zola is often credited with uh, writing about le bête du monde, or like the human beast. Basically, people are animals, and there's nothing that makes us different than them. And uh, von Stroheim definitely vibes with that energy. Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it's not a surprise that this uh, maybe hasn't aged as well over time because this is, uh, you know, spoiler, folks, this is a. Uh, not a very uh, enjoyable experience. <laughs> this is uh, uh, almost like something Peck and Paul would dream of after a bender. Just like, oh, yeah, everyone's terrible. Everyone's greedy and everyone fucking sucks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to. This. Li- more movies should do this. More movies should be credited as personally, personally directed, directed by. Right. Well, I mean, especially nowadays when you have impersonally directed by a lot of people who make movies for like Apple or Amazon or whatever. And more people should know. do this, dedicated it, to my mother. Just well, like us, right? We and, do this and, you know, it's, 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 I wonder uh, what his mother would have said watching this movie going, oh, you uh, dedicated this to me. This uh, uh, which whole one am miserable I? thing. Uh, thank you, Eric, I guess, for doing that. Uh, now, you know. what what should I know, or what should people know, assuming this is their first, like, foray into, like, von Stroheim films and stuff? Like, well, is this a good, like, jumping point, or, like... I mean, many people would say this is his masterpiece. I, I think I'd be inclined to agree. I mean, my favorite von Stroheim film is probably uh, Foolish Wives, which he makes right before this. Um, von Stroheim didn't get to make a lot of films because he was kind of infamous from the start of being a weird control freak um he studied say. yeah he studied under dw griffith he's actually uh he wrangled the horses for intolerance and i think you can spot him as a pharisee in that for a second uh and then he acted in a number of films wanted to get into filmmaking his first film he called the pinnacle the studio changed the title to blind husbands that wouldn't be a huge change to most people but von Stroheim like took out ads in the trade papers to complain about how they were massacring his movie. Well, you know, totally normal behavior. Uh, then he makes Foolish Wives. I believe both of those were for Universal. Uh, and then Universal, Carl Lumley was like, I'm having no more of this with this asshole. Like, Foolish Wives was getting so expensive and taking so long to make. And then he moves over to MGM. MGM lets him adapt McTeague which is what we're watching now. And, well, McTeague is the book upon which this is based. And, uh, yeah, as noted, he had an eight-hour cut. That got cut down to four hours because they ended up bringing Irving Thalberg over to MGM, and Thalberg and von Stroheim butted heads constantly. So... Yeah, was that was that what you meant by what we should know about von Stroheim, Kyle? Or? I mean, also just in general, like, in, just in terms of his, like, his... You know, artistic style, or you know, just as yeah. I guess. Uh, he hates people. That's, oh, great. Um, okay, cool. Well, that's something I uh, absolutely vibe with with him, and something I uh, greatly enjoyed about this movie that uh, everyone sucks. Don't trust them, and uh, you know, everything's gonna end up poorly. It does feel kind of timeless in in a way. I mean, and not that it you know, I, I feel like it's a broken record every every show. But you know, if there are people looking at these films and feeling apprehensive because of a black and white film, like I was surprised just how prevalent a lot of these films and like how you could get from point A to point B and still feel like, oh yeah, I'm 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 in it, even though this is what nearly a hundred years old now. And and here we get the first introduction of this bird motif. Yeah. Um, the bird motif is definitely an element of the Frank Norris novel. The Frank Norris novel relies more on the symbolism of gold. There's a um, there's a recurring image of this giant gold tooth that McTeague wants in his dentist office, and uh, Trina buys for him. That is in the four hour cut. All of that was filmed. It just doesn't make it here. Um, another interesting thing about this: apparently, in the eight hour cut, von Stroheim intended to get into McTeague's backstory in a way that even the book doesn't touch on. We were going to see his childhood and his family and all of that. We don't get any of that in this, right? Oh, I love this moment right here. Just, just absolutely just eat you. Yeah. right down the hill. <laughs> I don't. I. I mean, I. I did the McTeague. Like, I did read the McTeague book. I don't remember him throwing a dude in the river. But other than that, like, the film is pretty loyal to the book. Do, does he throw multiple people down? A, I mean, he's a, a violent the, the dude. There is. Cutter? We'll get to it later. Such was McTeague. It's a great title card. We'll get to it later, but. Um, one thing I do love is that in the novel, uh, McTeague and uh, his romantic rival get into a wrestling match at a family picnic and almost murder each other. Well, that's, I mean, we absolutely should have had that in the movie. That's a pretty pretty silly uh, uh, exclusion from the text, I, I have to say. 
uh, n- not a fan of that. So you know, I mean, watching the four hour restoration, it is interesting because I think it's a. I mean, obviously, the four hour restoration just uses stills. You're not seeing new footage because it's all gone. But you could just tell, like, four hours was a better movie. Such like, was Mother Matigue. Such was Mother Matigue. Four, four hours may have been a better movie, but uh, it is almost uh, kind of ironic to, to make a movie called Greed, and uh, you, 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 you try to make a movie that's eight hours long, and then you try to get it to, like, all right, well, at least let it be four hours. Uh, kind of greedy in how much uh, real estate you're trying to take up in, uh, you know, movie houses. Uh, I... By I the way, watch, this... I'm oh, sorry. You said that? Well, I didn't watch the four-hour cut because, uh, you know, it's not really a movie. It's uh, stills. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, that's if, that's interesting. If you me. notice that tooth on the dentist cart, uh, that actually would have been gold when you saw the movie. Um, they did actually hand-tint this film back in the day. Uh, I forget the name of the process exactly. I, I wrote it down. But... Um, Let's see. Oh, was the Han... Oh, why did I do that to myself? I was like, let me look up what the name is. It's a German name. Hanschiegel color process. So you would actually use stencils to individually colorize the frames. Um, I didn't know you owned early rotoscoping, room. basically. Kind of. I mean, rotoscoping is more like an animation thing. But, but this was same this basic more principle. like Yeah, this was just painting out the film. Um, an interesting thing here, in the four-hour cut, if you watch it, there's like a solid half hour that takes place... Uh, of the time between McTeague's mom being like, you should become a dentist, and McTeague having his own dentist shop. There's a sequence where he's being taught by the other dentist, and the dentist wants him to operate on a woman, and McTeague refuses to, uh, because he thinks he'll get too riled up. And then he proceeds to work on a man and rip his tooth out with his bare hands. So, that was all... Well, I mean, that's just, that was just dentistry back then. You just <laughs> used your bare hands and ripped out teeth and said, you know, good luck. Well, that is the funny plot element, and it comes up later, but just the idea of... You want to talk about the changing of the times, the turn of the century, just the idea of them being surprised by, like, wait, I need a license to do dentistry? Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, b- back in the day, you know, fucking a dentist was also, like, a barber and a bartender. It's just like, hey, come on in, and I'll... Uh, crack you on the head with a hammer and then pull out your teeth and then you can have a drink in the same spot pretty easy it's also pretty funny that um, wish that's how it was today you do that introductory scene to show mcteague as a brute the book goes out of its way i was shocked early on in the book they just call mcteague stupid and an idiot in the narration like right from the get-go so the book does not care for mcteague either well i mean Nobody gets away unscathed in this movie. It's 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 you know, he he may wait a little longer to explain to you what a big fucking moron this guy is, but we do open up with him throwing a guy down a fucking cliff because he knocked the bird out of his hands. So also, mom mom's just you know full on eating a towel. So you know, clearly not the brightest of uh, gene pool going on there a lot a lot of dummies and there's even more characters in the book i was saying to kyle before we got well, here i have to also have to assume deleted stuff would have explained why that title card calls the dentist he learned from a charlatan yeah i mean it, it seems like it's it's a case of like he you know oh but we get so much background to them knowing each other by the way the gentleman you see here uh playing mcteague's friend who in the book has a lot of political opinions and I don't want to repeat them on mic. Uh, don't say it. But Marcus um, is played by Gene Herschelt, who most people probably know that name from the Gene Herschelt Humanitarian Award, the Academy Awards. Uh, and the love interest of McTeague, Trina, is played by Zazu Pitts, which is a very fun name to say. And also, she lived long enough to appear on Perry Mason. Oh, that was her cool. last credited role, I think, that she lived to see was Perry Mason. Surprised we haven't had a character named Zazu Pitts show up in, like, The Mandalorian. <laughs> she looks like a cartoon character. She she looks like Olive Oil. This, this character here, Maria, um, she is a major character in the novel. Well, yeah, I saw that uh, she's a major character in the longer cut of the movie, too. Yes. Well, the, long, the four-hour cut, the four-hour cut is basically just most of the stuff that gets cut is the two other storylines in the novel. So the novel has three storylines. McTeague and Trina is obviously our central storyline. She is a she is a, a mentally unwell woman uh, who keeps repeating two things. She keeps talking about how she had a squirrel and let him go. 
And she also talks about having gold plates when she was young. That her family had like a lot of gold serving dishes that were like worth a million dollars. Um, she ends up getting involved with a junk dealer. Um, who the book goes out of its way to tell you is Jewish. A lot. Because it's from the turn of the century. She ends up with a junk dealer who marries her because he thinks he's going to get the gold trays. Because he doesn't realize they don't exist. And, um... Yeah, halfway through the novel, Trina discovers uh, Maria's dead body because her husband murders her violently with a knife and then drowns in a river. And it was one of those, like, obviously it's trying to do a parallel here. Um, and then the other one is the uh, the guy who owns the dog hospital, who's an old man who falls in love with his old woman neighbor. And that one actually isn't a miserable fucking experience because it's like, oh, these two people didn't succumb to greed and they can just be happy. Yeah, that's kind of the contrast. You know, the, the novel does a great job contrasting. I think that woman, that woman you see there who just left the dentist chair, that is maybe the only time besides like, you know, background scenes or whatever. Like that's that's the woman who ends up marrying the older man. Well, that kind of, you know gets to the idea of like do you actually th I don't know if we even needed those two stories in this movie you know I mean it's long enough as it is just focusing on these two and to throw in two stories that are more symbolic to kind of contrast this main story like I get it in a novel and everything but by the time like we're this is the cut down version and it's two hours and ten minutes I don't really even know if we needed uh, extra storylines to, to get the point across because it's, uh, you know, not a knock. This movie's not subtle in the theme it's trying to get across of greed. You know, everyone's just a greedy fucking asshole and they do really stupid shit yeah, like, don't to take chase money. You know? I mean, I would have... Here's the thing. I would have agreed with you had I not watched that reconstruction cut. And I, I mean that because I, I understand the impulse with something like this, like Thalberg did, to go, well, if we don't need it for the story, let's get rid of it. But I do think that it's one of those things that we can kind of forget with a film, or with any kind of storytelling, but especially a film, which is that just because, you know, a film can be so much more than just the story, the same way that, you know, a song could be so much more than just the melody, and sometimes there's an impulse to, like, take away some instrumentation, because it's, you know, you, you, you want to get a stripped-down version of the song. Sometimes you're better off with that full orchestration, and I think that what greed did especially how it was meant to be viewed which was i think his eight hour cut he wanted seen over across two nights i think what von stroheim's doing with greed and, and with foolish wives he wanted to do too is the idea of treating some cinematic works like you would an opera right and i think that in doing so he's viewing it because remember we're in the early days of cinema so we don't really know we don't really think of films as something that you kind of go see and then go home and have the rest of your day. It's more of an all-day affair. And I think that in that sense, when you get through McTeague and you have these concurrent storylines, the feeling of it at the end hits a lot more. No, I, I get that and everything. I'm not saying it would be bad to, to... Like, I wish we had that footage and everything. I wish we could get it. But I do, I do kind of like... Just, I'm sorry, can we acknowledge a title card for the first time in his life? McTeague, McTeague felt, felt an, an inkling, inkling of ambition, ambition to please, please a woman. woman. I mean, And that's uh, kind of generous, seeing as how she's, uh, you know, going to be knocked out, and he's going to have to stop himself from raping her, which is uh, kind of an interesting way to, to, <laughs> to start your movie, and basically tell your audience oh yeah there, there is no hero here yeah when you texted me your first time watching this and you were like oh weird to have your hero kind of well, be a i'm like i promise you it well, it gets worse i meant yeah. hero in the sense of your protagonist yeah. because even like fucking taxi driver or like doesn't start with him being that much of a fucking creep like it's like oh he's a creep but he's not like shooting black people in bodegas just yet he's he's got to build up to being crazy this one is like no no this guy is he's just bad and he's barely holding on by a string his thin sense of what he thinks is moral or not um well it's also because these people are so ill-informed too like and i don't mean that to to kind of do like a you know a tisk tisk or anything like that 
but just more like there is this clear thing like she trina is terrified of sex right she's terrified none of these people seem to understand what sex even is for the most part uh in the world of of mcteague slash greed and that's something i'm sure i was driving at i mean his filmography is every one of his films has a sexual element to it every one of his films um the very first film he makes blind husbands is about an affair is about uh, a woman a married woman falling for a roguish um general or military person played by von stroheim and having an affair and then foolish wives is about this grand seducer again played by von stroheim we'll cover foolish wives in a future season so i don't want to say too much but i'm just gonna throw a big spoiler warning for foolish wives here it ends with eric von stroheim uh trying to molest a mentally handicapped girl and her father brutally murdering him and then ditching his body in a sewer. Oh, wow. Pretty and cool. None of that is in title card. All of that is on screen. So that was Eric. Uh, and then he makes this. I mean, he was working on a third film that he ends up, uh, I think, called The Merry-Go-Round, I want to say, that he gets fired from halfway through. And that will continue being the case for the bulk of his career. He gets fired off of films a lot. <sighs> in fact... Uh, he got fired off of a movie that he was directing for uh, for Gloria Swanson called Queen Kelly. And uh, Gloria Swanson personally had him fired off because he was so difficult to work with. And then, of course, they work with each other on Sunset Boulevard when she's Norma Desmond and he's her assistant. And they screen footage of Queen Kelly in Sunset Boulevard. So that had to be fun for Eric. Good days on set. Good days on set. Good reminders of... Uh... How, how how high he soared and, and how his career didn't suffer any setbacks, leading him to play a supporting role in a movie to the woman who had him fired off a movie. That's That must have felt great. And we did just get another return of the bird motif. Uh, again, in the original cut of the film, in the original intended version of the film, the bird would have been colored yellow from the stencil. Mm. So it wouldn't have been, you know, some silent films you see, like the whole, f- all of the frames themselves would be tinted, right? This would have been more specialized and like individual items would have been colored. Terrified at almost raping a woman at, at his place of business, he decided to not do it. I love this little stupid entrance from Zazu, uh, from uh, from Gene Hirschholt. Like I loved it when I when I read because I it'd been a, it'd been a couple like a year since I had last watched Greed, uh, maybe a little less, but it, it hadn't been that long. So when I'm going through the book of McTeague, when I'm picturing uh, the Gene Hirschholt character, I sure as hell was not picturing Gene Hirschholt. The book depicts him as a much more, I don't know, I picture him as a much more noble looking type, and I love that this movie just makes him an insufferable goof. Yeah. Oh, he's an absolute dope, and I feel like we skipped over another element that brings it back to an earlier day of uh, living, which is that uh, his intended fiance is his cousin. Yep, yep. It's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, that guy would have been a great mayor of New York. Um we, which we should also note, this is, uh, speaking of New York, we should note that this is not only set in San Francisco, um, but Von Stroheim shot on location. So this is one of the first films to shoot entirely on location. Yeah, all that location shooting may, uh, helped uh, make this uh, filming process last for two years, which uh, must not have made the Money Men all that happy. I was going to ask, like, did that have, like, an increase, like... Did that increase the budget at the time of oh, films? Oh, yeah. You know, like... Buddy, this was a disaster. Uh, this was like Heaven's Gate, Waterworld level shit going over budget and over schedule. Well, because, you know, take for take this for what it's worth, but the, uh, you know, you look at the budget on Wikipedia, and again, take it with a grain of salt, but the budget in 1924, or I should say 22 through 24, is $665,000, which is... Uh, a pretty hefty sum back then, which uh, doesn't pay off since, uh, again, grain of salt, box office was $274,000. Oh, wow. That is uh, quite quite the bomb for a movie that was supposed to be eight hours, cut down to four, then cut down to two, and cost almost three quarters of a million dollars back in the day. When yeah, they that don't, was a lot of money. This movie does not get recognized as like a masterpiece until the 50s. Well, That's I mean, when it starts to have its reappreciation. A, a film festival names it one of the, or I think a World's Fair. I have the have it written down here somewhere, but uh, it was named one of the best films of the century. 
Um, but well, because this this is falls into one of the cat the category that we talk about on this show sometimes, which is uh, a movie that uh, anybody who saw it that be, kind of became a filmmaker and was like, no, this is the greatest movie of all time. Like you guys have to watch Greed. This is a movie that hit creative people because you know this shit is way too dark for an audience that is going through prohibition at the time and is just looking for fun we just got out of the great war we can't legally drink let's go see a movie oh this two-hour movie about everyone being miserable greedy pieces of shit yeah we we had a grand old time before we went to the fucking speakeasies uh yeah not a surprise that this didn't hit the normies all that well and it's also, I mean, and speaking of people watching it, I mean, even Guillermo del Toro recently said it was, uh, said of Greed, it was a perfect reflection of the anxiety permeating the passage into the 20th century and the absolute dehumanization that was to come. So, it certainly still has its appreciation. And to your point, Tom, about not wanting, not fitting the audience at the time, I was watching a, a documentary on, D, uh, on not D.W. Griffith, on Eric von Stroheim, uh, a documentary short that can be found on the DVD set of the Young Indiana Jones Adventures. Of course. Um, because the final episode of that is about Sean Patrick Flannery as Indiana Jones having to help Eric von Stroheim get a movie in under budget. Weird thing. But they had a documentary on von Stroheim on there. And they had a quote from von Stroheim I thought was very interesting. Which is, von Stroheim felt that America, quote had grown tired of having chocolate eclairs down their throat and wanted instead to serve them a hearty dose of corned beef and cabbage. He said he had studied under the master D.W. Griffith and wanted to do him one better. Well, uh, he, he definitely missed one element uh, that D.W. Griffith would have put in this movie, which is uh, his very progressive views on race. So I think oh, maybe that's why... Uh, we, we definitely almost had it in this one. We definitely almost did, but uh, we don't. And I think maybe that's the reason why uh, it didn't uh, take the country by storm and get shown in the White House. Um, it's... Yeah, it's... It, it is funny, though, like, how prescient this movie is. Like Kyle was saying before, how it's aged so well, because, you know, if you study history even moderately, you know, it... America wasn't really America as we know it until the 1900s, basically. Um, America was, you know, was kind of always on the brink of just bankruptcy and being snatched back up by the British or even the French. Um, we didn't really get involved in any other affairs. We kind of just stuck to ourselves hoping things would get back on track as a train fucking passes by. I, I totally planned that. Um... You know, there's no middle class. That's not a thing that happens yet. And, but it, it really was around the late 1800s now, and now the 1900s, the gold rush and everything, where America's just obsession with capitalism and making money as the American dream really came in, in, into effect. You know, at what uh, a little before this movie, I think, maybe after, I, I got to get my numbers right, but this was around the time where Teddy Roosevelt kind of said, no, we need to stop this uh, monopoly shit. Five people should not be running the country. We need to give the rest of the country a fair shake. And I don't know, it's kind of what this movie's all about. Uh, everyone's just looking for money. Everyone's looking to rise up and gotta love the fucking this dopey broad with her Je fucking fake teeth gene herschel and not only her wearing the obvious fake teeth but the idea that gene herschel's character is like oh meet my cousin look at her teeth like he grabs her teeth and then contrast it with um with zazu pitch showing her her gold teeth which again in the original cut would have been colorized gold look at my cousin she's got such fucked up teeth if her teeth were a little better i'd be trying to fuck her instead but instead, I go for the other one, because I go for the looks. I'm a classy guy. Fucking good-looking cousins. Brazzers.com. What do you think if Eric Von Stroheim were alive today, and he was watching a movie that has already been cut down, and he, you know, if Eric Von Stroheim comes back from the grave, goes on YouTube, sees his film uploaded in a two-hour cut, and also hears a guy underneath it going, 
if her teeth were better, I'd be trying to fuck her instead. How do you think Von Stroheim would handle that? I think he'd be more curious about what Brazzers.com is, but that's just uh, me. Oh, there is no doubt Eric Von Stroheim would be well aware of what that was if he was alive today. Uh, I think Eric Von Stroheim, if he went to YouTube, would one, would be like, what in God's name is this? Uh, two, uh... I'm glad that there's a lot of anti-Jew videos on this site. Thank you for that. No, Eric Vesterham was not, uh, as far as I know, personally. If he's a I'm DW Griffith that. fan, I just assume well, he would want yeah. to see the racist stuff. Yeah. He, he'd, he'd want to see what Andrew Tate is up to. I just wanted to, I wanted to, I, I, wanted to um, I just wanted to clarify, as far as I know, I have no, I mean, I could be wrong. I, I'm not a Von Stroheim expert by any means. Um, we have two more Von Stroheim films to talk about on the podcast in future seasons, so um, I promise to you folks, uh, I will do some research into Eric von Stroheim, uh, quote, problematic on Google and see what comes up. Well, it's the early 1900s, and uh, he is, f- he, he, if he, even if he doesn't like, even if he doesn't have a problem with the Jews, he's probably not a fan of, uh, you know, yeah, he, two, I mean, he's two, definitely of our, got... two of the co-hosts of the show, not <laughs> liking the Italians, probably thought that they are just a, a snatch above uh, black people on the racial hatred card. Yeah, I mean, I, you know... But you know, for, for what it's worth, there's nothing. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's it's kind of there's a question of how much of this is him taking it from the book uh, versus how much demanding his own elements, um, and of course, what survives too. But this I love. I love this sequence here of this carnival. I mean, it obviously calls to mind things like the crowd or sunrise, which would both kind of be influenced by this film. Um, love this but, guy. Oh, yes, her dad. Well, that's the other thing. You want to talk about Italians or feelings about that? I mean, her family are immigrants. Trina's family are immigrants, and he gives them the funny dress, and he gives them the accents, but in a weird way, that was kind of an endearing thing at the time, right? So it's hard to necessarily parse out what the intentions were behind it. But I love this shot on the carousel here. I mean, I, I think this is the thing when when Van Schroheim talks about wanting to one-up D.W. Griffith, right? I think that's in part, like, I understand people give credit to D.W. Griffith for a lot. They give D.W. Griffith credit for things they probably shouldn't in a lot of cases because he stole more than he originated. But, you know, there's not too many times in a Griffith film, and it was early on, I'm not faulting it, but there's not too many times in a Griffith film where I'm like, that shot is incredible or that framing is incredible. It's more just about, like, the way it's edited or the particular scene that he sets. Whereas with what von Stroheim does, especially in Greed, but in Foolish Wives too, there's just gorgeous framing, right? Well, I mean, that's the thing, is that D.W. Griffith like, was just like going this. for spectacle, where this is actually, like, focusing on making it look good. He's got way. a good location, he's figuring out how to frame it. I love this. When they're going to do the reverse shot here, and we see them walking up, I, I, like, put it in my notes of just how... Oh, well, of course, we get the little... that, But this here, I just... There's something about the way that he frames... That, the train passing by, he understands the idea of movement in the foreground and the background. It's just, it is the next level. And I think when we talk about the evolution of film, the conventional idea is D.W. Griffith comes up a lot. Von Stroheim doesn't come up as much, even though he should, because this is the link between the earlier days of silent cinema and what comes later in the talkie era. Well, I think that's just kind of a lot of filmmaking with the silent era that hasn't lasted is that a lot of people can't really uh, make the break that you need to watch silent films. You know, most people are so conditioned to sight and sound. And, you know, there's there's a break with black and white films for people. People assume everything has to be in color, but maybe they could get through to that. But then you take sound away even harder and then then you throw into the fact that he was such a pain in the ass that his career kind of never really took off in the way you wanted it to and that you don't get people talking about greed until the 50s and even then it's mainly filmmakers it's you know shockingly not to it's not that surprising honestly that he doesn't get talked about i I just mean even modern film scholarship i feel like he's underrepresented when people are quicker to jump to i don't know if necessarily a king vidor anymore but you know there are other figures in this era by the way this concertina is a big motif in the book as well i think it's also just the darkness that he sees playing in i I think that's always a hard thing for film scholarship film twitter people whatever what have you to really reckon with it's always it's it's a thing we we see even more now that's kind of been progressing as the years go on is that we don't 
we see so many people can't handle dark movies and things that really deal with the darkness of man you know if if you people would say oh if you're making greed now you'd have to have a main character around these two to show how you know them tuss tutting and saying oh what what mcteague is did is bad and we're good you know they would they would they would demand that the the crux of the movie be the two old people around what's going on and i think that we also i mean it's it's so many people have this conception that older films silent films were not dealing with modern issues or couldn't talk about things right like you hear it said a lot about film of like well they couldn't talk about this back then they could and they do and they're pretty blunt when they want to be i mean two seasons from now we're going to talk about a film from around this period in the silent era called where are my children i believe is a lois weber film but i could be getting the filmmaker wrong um but it's just straight up about abortion which we're not doing like 20, 30 years later. We barely do now in, in cinema. But I think that, you know, you're right talking about the darkness. What von Stroheim is doing and what he does in his films that I think is so great is it's not just about, you know, a dark subject matter. It's that it's not, it's not suggesting dark subject matter in a way of like, you won't believe what some people are like. It's basically saying this is the reality all around us. Yeah, there's no all hope these in this movie. It's it's a bleak, dark movie, and I think honestly, what I think is is that so many people don't think silent movies were doing stuff like this back then because most people, kind of in their head, silent movies are Charlie Chaplin, yeah. Buster Keaton. Yeah. They think all silent movies were just slapstick comedies, and they go, "Well, uh, they were only making these things. They there was nothing. They weren't getting into the darkness and all this and talking about real stuff." It's, well, no. Yeah, Chaplin and Keaton were big popular guys at the time because people wanted to laugh. It was a dark fucking period in American history. But movie, they you know they were trying, they were trying. It just the things that have lasted are the ones that you kind of don't need context for the time to watch. You don't need to know about what was going on in America to to, to get a, a chuckle out of Charlie Chaplin just dicking around in a factory. You know, you you. you and even this, you don't need context, really. Like Kyle said, it has aged. You know, we, we are we are drowning in fucking people that think that if they just hit the jackpot, they'll be rich and everything will be fixed. And ignoring the fact that, no, you're all just bad people. Making you rich will just make you worse. Um, well, I think it's also, I mean, you know, we're going to get into it more as the film goes on. But I think one of the things that makes the McTeague book so interesting and makes Ultra Holmes film so interesting is it is perfectly reasonable to say that the conclusion of this film is like money breaks people but it's also the fact that none of these people are actually i mean like all of this could also be solved if trina had just been willing to go like yeah why don't we use the money we're married we should use the money right this is ours i think that it's it's you know i think part of the beauty uh, of making mcteague so dumb and there's a scene, so right now we're at the theater, we're seeing the aftermath. In the book, uh, and in the earlier cut of the film, there's a whole sequence before they go to the show where McTeague is at the box office buying tickets. And he tells the person at the box office, I want to sit on the left side of the theater near the drums, and or away from the drums, whatever it is. And the person behind the desk goes, well, if you want to be near the drums, you need to be on the right side of the theater. And he goes, well, no, I want to sit on the left side of the theater near the drums. And it's like a huge... And eventually the guy keeps trying to tell him, like, you're wrong. And McTeague's like, don't tell me I'm wrong, I'll clobber you. And I think that that's part of it, too, in this in this film, is McTeague and Trina and all of them, in so many senses, they're going through the motions and trying to do the polite society things, but they don't actually have any understanding of why they should or shouldn't do that. Neither McTeague nor Trina actually understands what marriage is, but they just do it. Neither of them understands, you know, they don't really get the world. They're a little too sheltered to understand the world. So that means when they're presented with real world problems, they don't know how to process it. Well, right? I think I think it's even darker than that. I don't even think it's that they don't know what it is. It's I think that they don't care that we, we just see how selfish they are. Like this woman marries this guy. And yeah, obviously she's not into it, whatever. She kind of does it because it's the time you get married, blah, blah, blah. But the second she gets that money. It's all about her. 
and all about saving money and doing this and she's not giving her husband when you know later on when he loses the dentistry oh, job oh, hang on real quick i just want to let you know this guy very happy that he uh, made time to appear in this film uh before he went to uh tell detective cooper uh, about the uh, murders in twin peaks uh, oh, yes. very nice. yes, it was very nice that he took time out of his day to uh, exist uh, here <laughs> and also at the same time in Twin Peaks, God, Washington. Geez, look at these goddamn, these close-ups are so good. I'm not trying to like derail like I was just, but just, no, they're, God, they're, 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 this they're, is such a good-looking movie. Yeah, it's a great-looking movie. I mean, it's, it's not shocking, but again, it's just that thing. You get so conditioned over time thinking silent movies were one thing that to see what they actually could have, what they were, what they were trying to do is, it's, it is always striking. You know, you, we don't see movies this dark often now. So you get conditioned thinking silent movies were just dopey good times where everybody was just hooting and hollering in between newsreels. You watch this and you go, fuck, right, yeah, and, you know, like, we saw a fucking the King Vidor movie. What was it? What was the name of the King Vidor movie? The Crowd. The Crowd. Yeah. You watch The Crowd and that, that takes you by surprise. Like, oh, wow, they did that back then? Shit. And you even get that in your head. You still get surprised. Like, fuck, this is, we don't even do this shit anymore. I also love the framing, too. Like, if you look in the wide shot, the, the lottery guy is not that much taller than Zazie Pitts. But when they do the close-up on the lottery guy and frame him from below and Zazu pits from above, they make it look like he is towering over her, right? Yeah. In those close-ups, you would think she is like five foot and seven foot. Um, but. Augusti. Yes, that's their, so they're trying to do accents here. Yeah. Uh, not sure it totally holds up, but, you know, it, it was a different time. This dinner scene is was way, way longer in the original cut. I mean, I, I could spend this whole commentary just <laughs> looking at every scene and going, this was longer, this was longer. Oh, we do get a little more Maria here. But that's pretty much the only of the four cut characters who gets anything to do in this film, in the two-hour cut. Yeah, and that's really just on basis of the fact that she actually intersects with the plot of this movie. And she had a title card there. Because one of her recurring lines is saying, had a squirrel, like one of the only words she knows how to say is, uh, had a squirrel, let him go. So she would have said that here. Um, there's a couple things that like, one of the things that is interesting watching the different cuts is that in some cases, scenes aren't cut. They just remove title cards. Mm, so like sense. subplots, Maria here saying, had a squirrel, let him go. or even like multiple times in the longer version of the film, Marcus says, don't do anything I wouldn't do. And so that's... We get one scene of him saying that in the two-hour cut, and they kind of play it as a gag, but in the original, like, it's a recurring line of his. But it is just interesting to think, in the silent era, you really could just change a title card and... and um, The whole thing. It's a whole different story, yeah. Uh, so just uh, as a little uh, context for, for the folks listening at home, mom and dad... Um, Five thousand dollars today would be a hundred and fifty k, so you 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 do understand how like that is a big sum of money, and you do you get at first why Trina is so like oh we have to save our money you know we 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 shouldn't spend too much because it's a lot of money but also like one hundred fifty k doesn't even buy you a house today, five thousand you know it's it's a lot not it's not gonna make you generationally wealthy but it's also i mean to that point it's a lot of money but it's also enough money that you could take a little from and that's what i think their big conflict comes from is well yeah, no that's what i mean you like know. you you get her in instinct like you go yeah because we do by this point we do get the sense that mac is a moron you know it it, it it's smart initially thinking of like oh trina's gonna be the smart one she's not gonna have him blow through the money whatever like okay great but it's just that creeping feeling of, oh, she's just going to be Scrooge. She's going to be Scrooge McDuck hoarding her money and swimming in a pool of gold coins whenever George is at home. Well, especially George because Mac. we get those gorgeous shots. I don't know when we're getting the first one, but, you know, uh, the film is, is largely realist, but we got those great shots of, like, those disembodied arms just digging through coins. Yeah. Right, which is, which is so good. But also, like, even this dickhead just like, oh, if I married her, I'd get the 5000 And then we, but, like, it's funny because we know he wouldn't get the 5000 
All right, guys, so uh, Tom here. Uh, Tom doesn't want to be here. Tom's going to have to be here, though, because uh, a button got pressed. Really didn't want that to fucking happen. Wanted it to be straight, a straight line. Uh, but a uh, button got pressed. Things got paused. 45 minutes in, I, you know, I, I just figured I'd have to come in and tell you. Mike and Kyle don't need to know. Uh, don't want them to know because I don't need to hear any more shit. I already do enough for this fucking podcast, so shut the fuck up, listen to the show, and get back to it, guys. I'm sorry, but also, just, I don't care. Bye. So, in the in the novel, she builds Noah's Ark animals, and that is also introduced in this cut of the film, right? Is that she hand-makes little toy Noah's Ark animals, and, uh, you know, that that's, it's this idea of, like, well, that's how we're going to, she's kind of like... Her attitude on her lottery winnings is like Jay Leno not touching his Tonight Show money. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like she's just going to make money off of the... Uh, oh, no, no, please, please don't go into the mic. We should have mentioned earlier, you know, we're on mic, we're live. There's definitely no uh, interruptions here. Um, but we are joined by a fourth um, guest, which is uh, Tom's dog Blondie is here. Nobody will ever be mad if you introduce a dog on the show. I'm just going to let you know. So please, please tell us more about Blondie. So just just so you know, guys, uh, folks listening at home or watching along with us, if she comes near my microphone again, I'm going to point it at her just so she can contribute. Blondie, bye-bye. What are you doing? Go away. Uh, oh, this wedding scene is fantastic. We, I picked the wrong time to, to take us off track, but this wedding scene is, is terrific. I, I love I, every detail. I, I told you, there, the, the, I mean, the copy we're watching now doesn't have any you know music over it, obviously, and whatnot, so I put on a, a playlist of silent film music, and it just happened to have a, a, a wedding uh, orchestra coincide with this, so it couldn't have been timed better. One of those happy accidents. It's just, I mean, th- this really, if you need a better example of why... Why Von Stroheim was one of the masters. Like, this whole sequence and the way it plays out is absolutely it. Like, every little detail. The wedding is described in the in the novel, obviously, but, like, this is just... I also think this might be the first time that she's in a color outside of black the entire movie. I could be wrong. I think, I think you might be right. I mean, we'll find out as it goes on, but I believe you're right. I also love that, like, there is a bit of a fisheye lens going on. We're seeing the film, so it kind of looks a bit like an old painting, like an Arnolfini wedding or something. Why does this guy look like the fucking kid from Bad Santa? (laughs) (laughs) I didn't think it would get that big a reaction. Tom, you have to remember, I've been watching this cut so many times. I've been watching so many versions of this film. I've seen him so many times. This is what happens when you take Billy Bob's advice too seriously. What if in the eight-hour cut, you know, there is a scene where he has an advent calendar that a, a drunken man eats and then puts Tylenol inside of? We I mean, listen, know. there's a few ways you can make this movie better, but I think that's one of them. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton just uh, just being a drunken fool and uh, banging the fucked-up tooth cousin up her poop chute. Which is one of my favorite running jokes in any comedy. Just that Billy Bob can't oh, oh, stop hang on, fucking hang on. Look, look. So there's in a funeral. The, yeah. In the longer cut, you actually see like the funeral procession happening outside. They establish it better. That's one of the few cuts that I think is much better in this version than the longer version. I is, love I love that it's just like almost like a, a joke. Yeah, it's just not commented on. Yeah, they introduce this sooner. Bef- I think before you see it out the window. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I believe like you know the funeral is happening before it passes outside the window and it's so much better. I think if it if it happens just like this, I love the way this plays yeah, out. Yeah, it's a, it's a better it's better example of foreshadowing than kind of just just throwing it in your face like, hey, pay attention to this funeral and it's, it's important and it's actually not. It's just a metaphor, you know. It's just symbolic and everything. So, just making it like a little throwaway joke is 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 perfect. Also, love little Augusti has a a little top knot uh, makes him feel like he'd be one of those guys running around Williamsburg telling you about uh, the dirt bag left and how he doesn't live in neighborhoods with black people. He's, he looks like he's he looks like he's about to tell you how much he supports the writer's strike and also hasn't paid a writer for any of his content in well, his entire he, he's life. He's about he's gonna he's about to tell us how he's very anti-war, but also Putin did nothing wrong. <laughs> that it's America's fault we're fighting in Ukraine. Uh, which is an interesting uh, topic for another day, but those people are morons. It's, it's really funny, guys, because normally when we do a show, um, we aren't synced up with anything, which means Kyle can cut out whatever he wants. And right now I'm watching Kyle in real time realize that 
all everything stays. He can't he he can't make any notes of what to cut out. Which is why it's so funny that I made you laugh that hard, and that it's now just it's stuck. We can't yep, cut it. There's out. no changing it. Just so guys, if your ears are still recovering from Mike blowing out his mic, uh, you're it's, welcome. Yeah, it's it's. There's no changing it, and there's also no stopping and starting, which is why this has been one seamless record the entire time seamless we are seamless no and you can't order food from us but we are seamless that no absolutely not you have gotten on me for much better puns than what you just pulled right now that wasn't a pun it was saying seamless is a is a thing that people use what what are you pointing at Uh, i mean i was pointing the fact that you were like no you've got me on on worse puns and and Bucktooth Lady just looked at you like, oh, yeah, I concur. <laughs> Listen, Bucktooth oh, Lady, love, if she didn't have them teeth, she could get I, it. I, I love I this, say. by the way. This uh, just, you, you know, in some, the fact that they he really, Marcus is able to con, uh, convey his entire vibe with one shot, right? You don't need a title card for him just pointing at her and pointing at himself. And you're like, yeah, I get everything this guy's saying. Yes, such crackling dialogue. <laughs> Did Sorkin write this? I do. I but I do think that there's something about like she's so afraid of him. Prior to them getting married, up oh, we get the birds. Now there's two of them. This is getting out of hand. There's there, but that she's so indifferent to him until they get married, and now that they're married, you kind of see her start to like shift over from being totally distrustful of him to putting her entire self in his hands, right? But also, that seeing the birds, she gives him this look like, you got fucking birds? Why Why did you get birds, you fucking goon? Yeah, well, I, I guess what I mean is, is more the idea of, like, she's now just like, well, this is it. Now this is my guy. Now yeah, I, I have think, to Yeah, she, she's, it's not even so much she's putting her faith or whatever into him. She's just like, alright, this is this is the way of life. And also, uh, also a little bit, I'm the one that's in control. Because yeah. I have the money. No matter what, no matter how successful his illegal back alley dentistry business is, he, he's never going to have $5,000 in his pocket, and she will. The two flowers, they gorged! God, look at that, just the, the camera movement yeah. there. He really just... Oh, yeah. Eat just You just house that shit, bro. <laughs> fucking Dr. Robotnik is just housing that fucking... An actual head of something? Is that like a dog's head? What is it? What the fuck are they eating? These. I don't know, but Dr. Robotnik is just really just love. Oh, look at this guy. This guy is trying to make sure Mr. Deeds doesn't get his money. I'm not. I'm not saying that we. We did have to stop and restart the recording around the time where I was talking about the Noah's Ark animals, but if we did. The listener might notice a marked difference between the very academic Tom in that first segment Listen, I'm and still the be Dr. Acad- Robotnik Tom now. Listen, I'm still going to be fucking academic and everything, but this is a two-hour movie. There's got to be some got to be some space for bits, just like there's not enough space for that guy in that, that's, that chair. That's actually, that's actually, that was Eric von Stroheim's note to Irving Thalberg was there's got to be some room for bits. I mean, that listen, was his it's argument. Eight, it's, it's eight hours. You got to have some time for bits. You know, if, if you make a two-hour movie, there's no bits. Which is uh, oh, look at her. I, that's that's a thing that I don't remember being the case in the novel. I don't remember the cousin mattering at all, and I feel like the way that Frank Norris describes people, I would remember a disgusting, uh, you know, like a, a discussion of like, oh, this person's disgusting or this person's that, and there's like no mention of it. So that might be a von Stroheim. That might act literally be von Stroheim making room for bits in this movie. Hey, listen, I told you the guy wanted to make an 8-hour movie. You need bits to go that long. This is a this is a fascinating thing by the way. If you look at stories and books uh, from kind of the turn of the century from this period, this is a common motif that a lot of them go to, which is like the woman on her wedding night like terrified and crying to her mother about what the honeymoon is going to be and being like what am i what what do i do i'm so scared will i ever see you again and i i do kind of wonder if how much of that is a reflection of the reality of the time and how much of that is like a common trope and like kind of a gag you know what i mean like a bit of an over exaggeration right like the the close your eyes and think of england of it all 
Uh, it's probably a little bit of both, honestly. And But I do think it fits here and feels honest because she she clearly doesn't want to be with this guy. Like, if she had her druthers, she would not be married to this guy. She, you know, the, not only is he a big fucking moron and is kind of has a psychotic look in his eyes at all times, um, he's not going to be a good provider. I mean, I also think, like, part of it, this whole thing, she's so... I'm about to think, I, I don't think she knows what a lay is. I mean, that's the thing. This character is so terrified of sex, and everybody in this movie is so oh, She looks like fucking Nosferatu's coming after her. Yeah, um, but I do think, like, some of it, too, might be a bit of the Lillian Gish thing, um, or Dorothy Gish, I forget which one, but one of the Gish sisters, there's a story of they were so naive and innocent that when one of them got married to, to a man, she didn't understand that she wasn't going to live with her mom and sister anymore. Like, she didn't understand that she had to, like, go live with the man she married and that she didn't know what they would do together in bed or why they would even need to share a bed. Oh, well, she, this one, she knows what's coming. She knows she's going to have to not live with her family anymore. And she knows she's going to have to have to do some dirty deeds in their dirty ass bed with this. Just, just that, just that. Oh, my God. It makes him so creepy looking that over the shoulder. Yeah, he looks, like a, he looks like a fucking nut job. He looks like he's about to get executed at the end of a John Steinbeck novel. Oh, yes, Blondie's, Blondie's here. She has thoughts. Blondie, do you have thoughts? It's a couple of snips. And, and the microphone has now been licked. Oh, there was and a lick in a sniff. And it's now back at my face. Excellent. That's something. I do love, like, there's no way he could have known this because, you know, psychology and all study of, you know, sociopaths, psych- psychopaths or whatever isn't a thing at this point. But, like, the fact that this guy is so much more, like, interested looking at his birds and is happier looking at his birds than he is at any other point on his wedding night is just a perfect, like... I mean that's that's the Tony Soprano thing like that like we we know that psychopaths and sociopaths serial killers what have you are more connected to animals than they are to other people and, and I think we knew that we just didn't have a term for it then well that's what I'm saying like they didn't like he's not doing it because they know he read about it in psychology books it's just a thing of like if you're good at human you know, studying human behavior and watching the world you notice those certain things, and that's just one of those like things. The little, Love the little, yeah, the, 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 her having to be on his feet to even reach him. Also, just before, like, him approaching her is almost shot like a horror movie scene. He, he's, and, he's, he's a villain. And yet in that one, she, like, sits down on the bed and she's crying. It's almost like she's, it's not that she's so opposed, rather that she's, like, ashamed that she even has this feeling. You know what I mean? Like, I do think that it's a little bit, I love this, too, that the curtain doesn't close all the way, and you get to see him through the crack of it, but... And then the weight comes down together. Um, I think it's also representative of the fact that McTeague is trying to enjoy the sensations of life, uh, in a way, and Trina is so afraid of that, Yeah, that yeah. every part of her life she treats like the money, which is leave it in the bank, don't touch it, don't well, touch it. And that also, in, in and of itself, has to be a commentary on the way things worked back then, where men actually go out and do things, and women stay at home. And have to be the, the housekeepers. And a lot of guys like McTeague, these big, brutish men who work with their hands, they tend to go out and, yeah, they live their lives up drinking and cavorting and doing all sorts of shit. And she's got to be worried about, well, this fucking mope is not really taking care of things. I have to. And in this case, she actually can take care of things because she won the fucking lottery. So a little bit of commentary there. But also a commentary of... Even the best, you know, best intentions. Hey, I have to take care of the house. I have to take care of the money. You get, you get greedy. You, you don't want to part with your money, which is a thing we we see nowadays, you know. And it's a thing we talked about in Chinatown. You know, how much better can you eat? You can't, you you, you can't take it with you. But she's, she's taking her frugal caution to the extreme, making this guy pay for everything. And you know, you see that. I mean, that's that's the thing that I think, you know, obviously. McTeague is a murderer. He's a bad guy. No one is saying McTeague is a good guy, but I do think Zero that, out of ten would not recommend. But I do think that the film and the novel are both trying to drive at the idea of, like, that that this 
everything was building up to that moment, right? Not to suggest that McTeague, McTeague ever should have killed Trina, but rather just like, this moment didn't happen because McTeague, just because McTeague is some inherently evil man, and rather like, all of the circumstances around it that built up to this moment, right? That, that every step along the way of this, this could have been avoided. Well, it's it's basically saying, and which is, I guess, what the uh, the two other subplots we're going to get at, is that gr- money doesn't change you. It just reveals who you are. It brings out the true form. And, you know, brings out the true form in Trina. She's a kind of a frugal freak. McTeague is a just a goon a monster a guy who's just out for the basic pleasures and is will just kill for what he wants uh the the cousin is a fucking he's he's a shiftless layabout who just wants the easy money and doesn't have to want to work for it uh and then in the subplots you got the uh, the other two extreme versions of that you got then you got the old people that they're not actually bad money doesn't make them bad they they are who they are money just makes them comfortable and uh, it, it, it makes you wish you could have got those, but maybe not uh, over eight hours. You kind of could have maybe condensed them just a little bit. But, you know, what are you going to do? Oh, and Matt can only go to the saloon one night a week? What a bitch. Blondie, come on. Blondie. Get down. Come on. Come here. Oh, watch the movie with all, us. All stay it in. All of it stay in. Come here. Come here. But uh, you write about... Uh, Marcus too. I mean, in the novel, they he's not just kind of a layabout uh, who works at the dog hospital, but he's also has a lot of thoughts on politics, and especially a lot of thoughts on quote the Catholics. Oh, and McTeague is so dumb in the books and painted so dumb that he sits and listens to Marcus talk about politics, and then McTeague will just regurgitate Marcus's opinions as a way to kind of sound smart. Well, that's uh, definitely something that uh, we don't see happening uh, on Long Island and uh, America at large today. You know, there's a lot of, much more people, much more smarter po- political minds walking around the, you know, the streets this, these days. Mark is being such a piece of shit here with this. Um, the fact that now that he knows McTeague has money that he feels entitled to, now he's just going to nickel and dime him over every little debt. You know. But also, again, it's the f- it's even better because McTeague doesn't have any money. No, it's his wife, his, and, and this fucking jerk off. Even if he knew, he'd still do it. But it's the fact that he doesn't know that just makes it even that adds to McTeague's eventual downfall of just everyone just assumes he has this money and he doesn't. He's He's essentially the fuck. He's his, Trina's his sugar mama, but the the sugar has been cut off. Also, um, not to get into this now, but just just to be fair, you guys are all gonna split the cost of this ten box of munchkins, no. me, right? You guys owe me the money. No. Oh, here, let me, cost me. You let guys, me let you me guys regurgitate each, the you each, money I You ate, each though. owe me four bits for this. Uh, well, well <laughs> Tom's giving you two already, right? How many bits have you done so far? Yeah, uh, I've, I'm giving him nothing. Uh, you are in my home. That's the only the only downside. Well, not the only downside of the cuts, but one of the downsides of the cuts is that the other the the longer version of the film does spend a lot of time establishing the friendship between Marcus and McTeague to the point where like this feels like even more of a uh, of a of cold a, turn of a betrayal. Yeah, because this just feels very much like a yeah okay. Uh, I mean, Marcus rough. is still an asshole anyway. I mean, uh, for sure. Yeah, just like, but it's it's their relationship feels a little bit like. Um, this is a weird pull. You guys remember the Flintstones movie? With, uh, the Spielberg? The, f- the, f- one with, the, the with, first one? Not Viva Rock Live. No, 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 not Viva Rock Live. No, not Viva Rock Okay. Where the dynamic is basically like Fred. Fred sees Barney oh as such God. dope. Oh my God, Spielberg 100% so agreed. And it's like, you know what would be a good a good movie to, to influence the <laughs> Flintstones? Greed. Oh, I mean like... Because there is a thing like Fred thinks Barney is an idiot and keeps him around just to have somebody to tell Fred he's smart. And then when Barney ends up passing the test, right? Or in in the- Fred switches the test because he feels bad for Barney. But then it turns out Barney was smart all along, right? That's the whole... Yeah. That's the impetus of the film. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think that's a little bit the McTeague um, Marcus dynamic because Marcus is really only friends with McTeague to have somebody to. I guess I probably should have gone with Banshees of Sharon, which is a much more prestigious film to relate the Marcus McTeague relationship to. <laughs> but instead, the first pull I had was the Flintstones movie. No, but you know what? The Flintstones movie is more, I think, more accurate because the B- Banshees of Sharon doesn't have that, like. The whole point of Banshee of Sharon is that there's really no reason why these two stop being friends. It's just like, yeah. ah, I'm over it. Where in Flintstones, there is the money thing that affects the two of them. And also in the extended cut, uh, you know, Barney murders Betty. In the well, end, and then runs off to, to death out. For it. Yeah. You're drunk, that's what you are. <laughs> that's what that statement is. Actually, honestly, I think this this scene coming up is probably one of my favorite moments in the in the movie now that yeah, I remember. Yeah, this fucking jerk off pulls a knife. Yeah, yeah, but not only pulls it, fucking Throws eats it. it. Yeah. This is this is so much. Uh, again, though, if you have that wrestling scene from their day at the park, right, where McTeague, because that's the thing, McTeague absolutely overpowers Marcus, right? Yeah. Uh, as of course you would, and just like brutalizes the hell out of him, um, and that's one of the reasons I think Trina falls from. Uh, it's because of how brutal he is. Or at least he's willing to marry him. He's a brutalist. So that Marcus comes back and he is ready with a knife. Like, he understands he's got no shot of taking this down. This guy down barehanded. And he's like, I'll I'll do what I gotta. Naming, wearing his name on his belt as one does. And a little smile, darn you smile uh, sign right next to McTeague's head, too. I like that it takes McTeague a second to realize that he tried to kill him. Yeah, well, it's his friend. He doesn't understand. Like, he, he doesn't understand it. And he's just upset that his pipe is broken. I know and I, I know it's that, he, oh, it's my friend, but also, like, hey, somebody threw a knife at my head. And it takes him a little bit to kind of put that that uh, math together. I mean, I mean, again, the Gandalf pipe got broken first, so, you know, he's processing one trauma over another, so it's fine. Yeah, see? He broke my pipe. He's got his priorities straight. And for sense round, we're gonna we're gonna snap Kyle's little pipe over here, right? You got this. What is this? The vape pen? What is this over here? Should we talk about that on mic? No. You're gonna get in trouble. Well, I mean, you I mean, you just brought it up, so you yeah. might as well. I mean, it's not a it's not a low kept. I mean, what is this? A sauce? Yeah, right, well, Tom, you know, break well, it. Sun Dream Gelato. Well, listen, you know break what it. you know what J.R. Smith would say to McTeague at this point. <laughs> you trying to get the pipe? That was like 10 years ago at this point. Yeah, I know. No one's going to know what that is. No, every, anybody who has the internet knows the J.R. Smith, you trying to get the pipe story. So I'm not going to regale This is such now. a great title card. Max Moods of Wrath always faded in uh, entries. But yeah, we, we talked yeah. right over it to talk about J.R. Smith. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we forgot about what happened, as, as everyone else did in this It was Wednesday Adam's movie. looking bitch. Okay, I'm sorry. The second time that she wears white yeah this movie, i suppose yeah this is why we don't have kyle on the mic often yeah terrible. <laughs> but look at the way she's looking at it like she, that this is the nice thing about what von Schramm does is even going back to blind husbands like his his women do have interiority like blind husbands it doesn't paint uh the you know the the affair as one-sided and it doesn't paint the guy as a grand seducer like she's into him the women and foolish wives have interiority. Like, there is a balance here in a way that you really don't get in too many films of the time from male directors. I do like that he does, like, stand up to her. It's like, listen, like, hey, come on. Like, we, we have money. What, what are we doing here? It's a little bit. Instead of him just being, like, a complete fucking doormat where she just walks over him. Like, yeah, he's he's still not going to get the money, but at least he's he's smart enough to be like, hey, like, we have money. What, why why can't you send your your own mother money? Especially because when he says, you know, talking about the 50, he's not even necessarily saying dip into the lottery. Yeah. Right? That doesn't come up until later when she's like, oh, the lottery won't touch you. It's like, fine, give her some other money. Yeah, like we have a we have a thriving dentistry business. You you in in a deleted scene are are making little mini Noah's arcs for, you know, 
the the rabid fan base of Noah Ark toy people. I know if you were around back then, you know, your you and your father's Listen. house would be filled with n- tiny little Listen, Noah's Listen, pop, pop culture did not have quite as much IP back then. Like, everybody was still, like, real into Ben-Hur. What is she doing? Bloody, like, go, go away. Oh, I thought you were talking about in the movie. I'm like, you know damn well what she's about to do. It's the worst thing to happen in this movie. Theft. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I don't know if it's necessarily the worst. I, I, yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely definitely not the worst. There's some. I mean, in the longer cut, many people die. Oh. Because we also, in the longer cut, met McTeague's father and sister, I think. It's definitely his father and I believe his sister. I absolutely love all of her facial expressions, like post-marriage, basically. Like, she just seems like she absolutely knows, like, what she's doing is, like, shady, but she has, you know, just no desire. She's just, she's just gonna do it. Whoop. Yeah, and I mean, that's the thing. It, it, the other thing that makes it interesting is it's not like she's buying expensive things, right? Oh, look at her doing little, yeah, her little, little Mr. Little, Burns hand yeah, rub with her yep, little hand grip. Yep, and then his little fade... If Mama really needs somebody that badly, she'll I mean, write look at again. That. Jeez. Yes. Excellent. Yep. It would be so funny if, like, the next scene was, like, they're at the mom's funeral. <laughs> maybe maybe in the eight-hour cut it was. We can't prove it. Oh, this. The, here Ooh, we go. yeah. But also, like, with these really just fucked up the, arms. Yeah. Like, this is just an upsetting visual. Like, who the fuck did they get to... to, to like with arms like this did they go to like some fucking circus side show that's definitely not those definitely aren't zazu pitts's arms no those look like death's arms they look like they they're not even double they look like they're triple jointed but her brusque her miserly attitude grew steadily through the following but her brusque outbursts of affection kept her tolerable to the slow thinking mcteague she gave him handies nobody has ever burned a character that badly (laughs) what a description (laughs) Oh, McTeague is getting uh, a little too wise to my ways again. Time to give him a little bit of the tip. Yeah, it's very... I mean, like... And then... Yeah, oh, oh, here comes... Here comes Gene Herschel. In not being a humanitarian in this case. That's true. I wish I knew more about Gene Herschel, but I don't. I just know that the award is named after him. I don't know much about his own activism as to why. But Hello, here's... friends. Remember that time I threw a knife at you? What? I didn't do that. By the way, I'm leaving now. I'm leaving, and uh, enjoy your dental practice that I definitely did not report. Oh, this. So the cat is not in the book. This is entirely a visual thing that Von, uh, Von Stroheim added, right? Because he really leans into the bird visual thing. And I, you know, in a film today, maybe we'd call it a bit on the nose that they let in a predator that fucks up the bird's cages but it's such a smart move in this one because i think the first time you see it right you you don't know about what's going to come the letter about the dentistry you don't necessarily so it is a a great piece of foreshadowing without giving away the game but then the second time around you're like oh okay he's he's really he's, he's he's you know he's letting us know what's about to go down There's a very happy dog looking at me right now. Yeah. She's looking at me so she doesn't know there's about to be a cat on the screen. Wanda, you want to find a cat? Where, the, Where is the kitty? Go find the kitty and destroy it. Just like that bird is about to destroy the uh, the birds in that cage. Going in cattle ranching with an English duck. Shut up, man. Just shut up. Is Marcus your least favorite character in the film? Oh, and I, I, would, I mean, like, I think if that question. you... Okay. Oh yeah, he's he's, you know, because it's not a thing of like, oh, you can you know sympathize or like explain away what Marcus does or what uh, Trina does or whatever. It's but it's like, all right, you you understand where each person's coming from, and there's like, whatever, you get it. You know, she's trying to do this, he's trying to do that, blah blah blah. This guy is just such a piece of shit. Oh, cat watching the birds. That close up on the cat's face. That looks like the um. It, it looks like when they do the close up on Jonesy and Alien, you know. Oh yeah, 
Oh, yeah. I, I feel like Ridley was definitely another one of those guys that saw this and was, like, pulling from it. All right, guys, I'm going to leave now with my English duck. And uh, everything's going to go smooth for every single person, and dentistry will be the way of the future. Do not ever think that things will go bad for you ever again, Mac. I leave you with good tidings. Like, it really, that is the thing, is is that for as much as one may not like McTeague, like, what, a, what an absolute bastard Marcus is going out on that note. Yeah, that's that's some real shit heel energy. Hello, kitty. Yeah, here we go. You get the close up on the cat's face again. And, and, and wait for it. Oh no, we still got uh, we got we got a fade from the cat to Marcus in case the in case the metaphor was not strong enough. And now here, I do love this moment so much that Trina's just. <laughs> And clowning on him when he leaves. Oh, thank like, God that asshole's like, leaving. This is the closest we've seen them in the movie. Right? Yeah. Like, I know they, like, snuggle points, but, like, this is the first time you really feel them as a couple. Goodbye, that's the best thing I've ever heard Marcus say. She fucking hates him by this point. <laughs> yeah, they're laughing. They think it's all good. Never, Never again, again should they be disturbed by him. Well... Oh, Blondie has more to, to note. More to contribute. Do you think they should have ended the movie here? I think I stumped her on that one. Oh, she's she's smiling now, so I think yes. I think she said that the movie should have ended also, here. Oh, oh, cat, cat coming. But unfortunately, there is a cat here, so. Yep, yep. I also like that it says Mr. McTeague. McTeague never has a first name. No. Not in not. the movie and not in the book. His, his, his first name is Mr. Like they just call him Mac if they're not Mr. calling him McTeague. McTeague. No, ma'am. One of us probably should have read this letter aloud. That might have been nice. Probably, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Sorry, I'm. Oh, I'm... cat jumping on the. Yeah, ah! There we go. There we go. Hey. I love that this cat does not seem on board with being on this cage. At all. All right. So I was just uh, looking through some stuff I, I read, and um, Mc... he's never named. He's only named McTeague, and it's uh, people believe it might be derived from an anti-Irish ethnic slur, Taig often uh, anglicized as Teague. So it might be uh, might be a little anti-Irish stuff creeping into this uh, story. Oh, oh well. Which, uh, really, are... from, from Frank Norris, the guy who made sure to tell you that the bad money-grabbing character was Jewish a lot in his book, I refuse to believe that he had yeah, so any I... thoughts on people based on their ethnicities. Yeah, so I wonder if, uh, if uh, Eric there kind of knew, uh, knew that going in or was just like, yeah, McTeague, that's a name. There's nothing weird with that. I love that close-up they showed before of her, like, squeezing the sponge in her gloved hand when they get the report of the dentistry thing. Like, just little, little flares that Von Stroheim throws in along the way. And I think also the fact that when they met, like, he was very much... Oh, oh, cat's back. Uh... Oh, <laughs> What a, what a stupid running thing for me to do in this commentary is just point out when there is a cat on screen. It's, yeah. But uh, I do like the dynamic has kind of shifted uh, that before she was kind of looking to him and now with something like this, he kind of looks to her to be like, well, what do I do? What, another do do? another timeless uh, American uh, lesson here. Uh, people not uh, stopping what they're doing because they don't have a piece of paper. <laughs> Let me tell you. Get all the money you can before they make it. Just why? To what end? You have you have money. You you could absolutely survive at least long enough for McTeague to get a degree no, or but, get something. No, get more before you before you get regulated. Get more. Come on. Those shifty little eyes. I I I love her eyebrows in this movie. I 
kind of sounds like the Banshee of Inishirin in our headphones right now. It's just an airplane flying over. I think that's that is a great thing, too. The fact that they they introduce in earlier, I'm not sure how introduces like the cat alongside Marcus. Definitely make sure you associate the cat with Marcus, so that to to show us her thinking, you just show us the cat looking at the cage. Right? You don't do a flashback to Marcus. You do a flashback to the cat, and that represents her realizing it's Marcus. Oh yeah. Which is a smart link, because anybody else would just do a flashback, right, to the actual guy. But this is a, a smarter way to communicate that thought process. What does it say about dentistry that McTee could be a successful one? It says at the turn of the century, we really didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. It was just like, dentistry was largely just, is this tooth messed up? I'll take it out. I'll just give you some rum and I'll... I'll clonk you on the head with a hammer. And we'll, we'll replace some teeth with some fake teeth, and that's about it. Now, this the I, I I'll take this moment to say the gentleman playing the lead role of McDeek did work on other Eric von Stroheim films, but is one of those guys who was like, a, he had a lot of bit parts in silent films. I believe he's in an intoler- he's in Intolerance, he's in a bunch of silent films. Doesn't really have a career once sound comes in. Whereas, whereas Zazu Pitts was able to make the transition, at least to some degree or another. Well, I mean, he looks like he's 55 years old. <laughs> I don't know how much longer this guy was going. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's just one of the grand tragedies of the tri- transition from silent to sound. Stopping my teeth's practice. To gr- the grind began. Yep. Oh, this is the, mom- the moment everything starts unraveling for them. They're, they're already uh, the grind. What, what's the phrase we say now? The grind. What, like, rise and grind? Rise and grind, yeah. Well, you know, the... Mm. Grind set style. mindset. Grind set mindset. There you go. Even in even in the twenties, they're like, "Up, oh, grind set mindset, boy." Well, in this case, though, the idea of the grind is portrayed as a negative, right? I mean, shit. Even now, but, it's portrayed as a negative. Everyone just now, now now we've swung all the way back to every moron that says, "Grind set, baby. We go. We're working hard and make that dollar." And you just and everyone's just like, "If you say grind set, I know for a fact you're a moron, and you fuck well, with the lights off." But I think it's also like there's a difference between the grind that these people go through and like what we see around the same time, which is Harold Lloyd's character, right? His glasses character, who's the young go-getter, right? And I think the difference is, you know, there is this idea, this sort of um, Horatio Alger idea in America at the time, which is like, you can, you know, you can start with nothing and work your way up. But it's still seen as tragic when you lose everything and have to restart. And that's what I think is the interesting thing about the McTeague dynamic is like that he was building a life and then he has it taken away from him. And in American storytelling, like we don't necessarily like to think about setbacks, right? We like it to be upward trajectory. But we can't conceive of the idea of like the government took McTeague's livelihood. Yeah. Rightly so, he wasn't licensed. He, he should not be doing that. He's pulling people's teeth out with his hands. But, you know, this we're losing money every second you sit here. This is, we can't afford, why not? She looks like a ghoul. That's the, yeah. to her credit, like Zazu Pitts does a fantastic job of this transformation throughout this movie. Like, you really do get to, they, these are two great performances. Thank <laughs> you. 
she, she really looks psychotic. <laughs> looks like she's wearing a fucking like like a Russian hat. Well, that's I mean that's the fascinating thing is is, is I mean you look at the shoes you look at everything like she she is living uh, an almost poverty lifestyle despite having money, right? Yes. And she won't give him any, like this, you know, this is what it's building up to. Is there supposed, look at the way she's trying to take, make sure he doesn't have any, like this is, again, no one is, no one is saying that the ending is how things should end, but it's rather just like, this is not a way for people to live. Okay, do you, okay, I made it, I made it as a joke that she looks like she's wearing a Russian hat, but do you actually think maybe it's kind of a point that, um, the Bolshevik revolution is over or like kind of happening when this movie starts filming and ends when it's over that he's making a point oh about God. communism. This, this shot. Look at this shot. Looks like it could be from a goddamn Twilight Zone episode. Oh, yeah. Better give me a nickel for car fare. It's a look. Wow. This just you just feel it in this one, you know? Like this is the moment things turn. Yeah. Big fellow like you, afraid of Jesus. Women, am I right? <laughs> no, Tom, Tom, people might be finding this from the YouTube algorithm. They might not know what kind of podcast this is. We're not that type of show. I want to be clear. We've already talked about grind set mindset. Now you're saying not that. that show. Yeah. Hashtag not that bitch. Man, see? <laughs> That's what it would have... That would have been the cue had, had sound been around when this film came out. <laughs> Squeezing my money. But the, <laughs> the funniest thing, before I came here, I decided to throw on a bunch of phone. I was watching the beginning of The Great Gabbo. Have either of you guys ever heard of The Great Gabbo? No. Oh, this. Look at the, all the arms coming in. Money, 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 money. With the cobwebs on it, too. Money. Like, you're just just really laying it on thick. This nightmarish vision. Money. It's a hit. Well, hang on, but look at these arms, too. Like, this is Meshes of the Afternoon. Yeah. Also, the arms look like they were kind of given a cat print yeah. on them. Hey, come in. You want to have a drink? I know you wanted a drink. It's a cold out there. You know, I lost my brother Luigi in the rain. I was going to say the guy gives me a bit of Guillermo del Toro vibes, but I agree with you too. Oh, I could shift into a Guillermo del Toro. No, come in, cocksucker. No, <laughs> you want a fucking drink, you cocksucker? Yes, it, the drink. Tom, you... Like, I understand Guillermo del Toro does have a foul mouth. I'm not disputing that. I've definitely heard it. But you do make him sound. You make him sound like the, the angriest, most, most like, you know, a working blue comedian in the world. You make, you make Guillermo del Toro sound like he's Andrew Dice Clay. Well, now that I want to see. <laughs> Hickory dickory dock, uh, cocksucker. Hickory dickory duck. Kronos is about the clock. Anyway, all right. Kronos is about a vampire with a clock. <laughs> and the vampire is a cocksucker. She's polishing I just love her, her polishing mind. the coins. Gold was her master, a passion with her, a mania, a veritable mental disease. Mm. Gollum, Gollum. Really, that was the bit you were going to go. I really thought Goldmember was coming out for that one, but you know what? Fuck. We can never predict. <laughs> oh, you're even mad you didn't think of that one, aren't you? Listen, she likes gold. <coughs> if only his dick was smelted in an unfortunate, unfortunate accident. Unfortunate smelting accident. An unfortunate smelting accident. God, I don't... I. This is a slight tangent, but it, this is a fine little point. Did I tell you I watched all three Austin Powers back-to-back -back while I had bronchitis? 
No, you didn't. So, Belle and I took a trip up to... I, I never say anyone's show, but it's fine. Um, we were taking a trip up to Kinderhook uh, in New York to see, like, Martin Van Buren's house, go apple picking, stuff like that. I promised her it for a while, but I got sick, like, a little while beforehand. Thought I'd be fine. By the time we actually went up there, we had our B&B reservations and everything. I felt like such dog shit that after we toured the Van Buren house that we went there for, we went back to the B&B, and I was like, I just need to lie down for, like, a minute or two. And I couldn't get back about it bed. I felt so sick. So I was like, can I just put something on the TV? She goes, fine. And I put on Austin Powers because it was on Netflix. And she was like, I don't want to watch Austin Powers. I'm going to take a nap. Kept sleeping in and off. She goes, but after Austin Powers, can I pick what comes on? I said, sure. And then uh, she fell asleep when the credits started rolling on Austin Powers. And Netflix was like, hey, if you don't pick something else, we're rolling right into the spy who shagged me. And I went, let's see if she even notices when she wakes up. (laughs) She just thinks, man, this movie's long. And... Again, slept during the end of Spy Who Shagged and we rolled right into Goldmember. And at a certain point, she went, is the, how is this the same film? I mean, that 100% tracks <laughs> with, with knowing Bella for as long as I have. <laughs> Gee, I slept I mean, for honestly, eight hours. Hon- is, this, is Austin Powers greed? <laughs> that perhaps that is, you know, that could have been the fracturing point for us akin to what's happening right now on screen, Right. You don't gotta make small. You don't gotta make small of me all the time. That's the thing. He's so brabby. That could have been, you know, maybe for her and I, what broke up the relationship is when she realized that I had had all three Austin Powers play, play back to back to back. And she she notices it and goes, "You don't make small of me." That's the other thing that's in, so interesting here is that this particular conflict. Which is, is, I think this is something that Stroheim does very well in this film, which is less so in the book. Which is that at certain points, McTeague's not even mad about not having access to the money she won. He's just like, why, like, at least let me have, if you're going to hoard your money, at least let me have my money, right? Yeah, I, and that's the thing, what I, what I was saying before, is like, you, you get why he gets to the place he gets to. It's not like this out of nowhere thing where it's just oh well it's because agreed it's like no he you get it like if you were if you were in a marriage like this and you were married to someone who was rich but they kept taking your money yeah you can it is a silent film and you can still hear him screaming at her that's how big that that was in the best way oh yeah i mean he called her a see you next tuesday yeah and and the fact that like i do love the fact that he's so angry right he's so upset and she just decides to double down on did you get a place did you get a place did you get a place yeah she's such she's just so completely detached from reality at this point and just attached from empathy that she's just like yeah well did you get a job dickhead i'm gonna throttle you Me too, McTeague. Me too. For the people who are just doing the audio on this, a title card just came out saying, yes, I've been drinking whiskey. And for the people wondering when we're recording this, uh, too early for Tom to be drinking whiskey this part of the day. Well, listen, it's always drinking time somewhere in the world. I and say, Mike, you of all people know it's five o'clock somewhere. And also... Kyle, I, I like the fact that Tom couldn't remember that phrase and just went, it's always <laughs> drinking time somewhere. <laughs> You like that's that's a song by that Bill Paxton character it, from from Broken Lizard Club, Club Dread. That's a rip off. That's, of that's just George Buffett. Bush. What's yeah. his name? Hang on. What, what was that? Coconut Pete. Coconut Pete. Thank you. And, who's uh, his, who's uh, song? his song? Pina Colada, Pina Colada, Colada Burke. Burke. I wrote that song three and a half goddamn years <laughs> before. Yeah. And listen, this, you gotta if, keep drinking so film, you don't get a hangover. If this film wasn't about to get much sadder, I would just break out the full Pina Colada Burke. Listen, Bill Paxton as Coconut Pete is one of the greatest performances of the 21st century. I'm not even joking. It was the role that man was born to play. Well, I would counter that the the role Bill Paxton was born to play is his used car salesman in True Lies. The finest performance. Okay, it's a tie. But also... I was gonna. I forgot what I was gonna say. I had a joke lined up, and then you just threw me with with True Lies, and I'm like, yeah, he's so good in True Lies. 
in in retrospect, deciding to do our very first commentary on a two plus hour movie was perhaps tempting fate that we wouldn't get a little sidetracked at points. A silent film, no doubt, as well. Well, I would not do a commentary for a sound because I, the one thing I hate with DVD commentaries. I don't know if you guys do too, but it was always the most annoying thing that they would be remarking on dialogue in the film and then have the volume of the dialogue itself so low that you had no idea what the hell anybody just said. Well, I mean, that's a thing you kind of just have to deal with with commentaries. Is like you're you're here for the commentary. Oh, I know. I I just mean more like that specific. Up, oh, up. Oh, he's back. He's, uh, is this going to be? Uh... Oh yeah. <coughs> Are we about to get finger biting? Which, by the Ready way, the play the, bitey. The book gets so heavy into like, because that was the thing when I was talking to you, Tom, and I hadn't finished the novel yet. Um, I hadn't finished the novel yet. I was, uh, you know, I, I was telling you like, well, he doesn't kill her, but he bites your fingers. No, he does kill her later. But the finger biting, like the the book, spends a good chunk of time talking about like how how infected her fingers get. Well, it's it's really grim. Well. It's pretty perfect that it's this week after Succession. You want to play Bitey? This week after Succession, we say, by the time this commentary track is out, that show is over. We know how it resolved. Connor is president. (laughs) Kendall becomes that universe's version of uh, Elizabeth Holmes. And, uh... I don't know. You want to put all those predictions on the record, huh? No. Okay. Uh, uh, I, th- I think I think Roy. Uh, I, th- I think Roman's not making it out at the end of the season, unfortunately. But we'll see. Yeah, you know what? I do think he. I could see him just like finally just snapping and killing himself. This is gonna age so poorly. I I trust. I fucking hope it does. Right. I, we have. I don't, I don't want my. See, Tom doesn't listen to the show. He has no idea how many things we've said on mic that the next week or, like, by the time they come out, it's just like, oh, I wish we hadn't talked about that. Oh, didn't we? I mean, season two, more or less internally, was called the, the, the season of Ben Affleck because it more or less started. It started, yeah, it started with Tom talking about... His Phoenix back tattoo. Yeah, his, his Phoenix back tattoo. Just just chewing on J-Lo's butt and, on and a let's, And let's not forget season one with all of our comments about things happening at the Capitol when we talked about Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Oh, yeah. And then panicking the day before that episode's supposed to come out. I'm oh, sorry, that's what? my crowning achievement Did you guys, did you guys watch CNN? We might have to re-edit this episode. That, that's my crowning achievement of this podcast, of just just by sheer accidental force of will That was the creating the oh, Capitol God. riots. That was... That really was one of those things. It just that I... The audience has no idea. The text chain that went on between the four of us... Of like, oh, oh, God, oh, what's happening? Oh, no. Yeah, when you even get me going, yeah, maybe we should be a little more, uh, a little more we, sensitive we should, about we this. Maybe, yeah, we should maybe, we should maybe delay that. Uh, hashtag show. not that show. Yeah, hashtag not that show. As T- Trina's greed grew, Max's ambition waned and died. They sank lower and lower that Trina might still save from her meager earnings. Like, that is, I mean, again, not, we don't know a lot of relationship stories that end in murder. But uh, that is certainly uh, one of them. Uh, that, I'm sorry, we don't know a lot of them that end in murder, but that is certainly how a lot of stories we know end, is as one person's greed grows, the other's ambition dies, right? But, but as I was saying, you know, that's kind of... We all kind of know that story, in a sense, as relationships fall apart because one person just gives up internally, right? They get so browbeaten, they just, they just stop. And this is just, like, such a perfect, like, just example of her falling even further into just being such a miser that she's just gonna buy fucking like expired undisclosed meat to feed to her husband i i seem to remember i think in the novel like he after he bites her fingers he just bounces right like he just disappears for a while and i think this scene about the meats comes during that period in the novel maybe like i think there's something about just like we do get a little more time of like her just kind of subsisting on her own and still being that miserly right yeah so even without anybody around her to pressure her into you know uh trying to get the money away she's still just hoarding it like a maniac and she's got an uncle at the bank that like keeps the money for her which is a whole thing in the book and was in the longer cut of the film too was like even her uncle kind of telling her, like, this is insane. And at one point, she, like, 
there's a whole subplot of her t- taking out little sums of money just to look at it and stroke it. Yeah. And then her uncle eventually being like, let's just, no, just you can't keep doing this. <laughs> yeah. Either take the money as a whole or don't take the money. This is getting weird. <laughs> oh, I just realized because uh, you can hear uh, our voices on the side of other mics, even when I hit my cough button, people are still going to hear me cough. Correct. I'm so sorry, folks. Yeah, yeah. I'm going for surgery soon. It will be fixed soon. We're hopefully... By the time you guys are hearing this, I will be out of the hospital. Or I didn't make it out of the hospital. It really could go one or two ways. Great. Love that. Did we so, you know, did, did we make sure that the insurance this could be a posthumous, got This could be a posthumous before, release for all we know. Great. Love that. It's going to be my first Grammy. This is your, this this is is your fir- Puff gonna- Daddy's I'll Be Missing You? <laughs> Wait, Kyle, what is, your, what is your reference point for uh, grief-related Grammy tracks. Grief-related Well, because you're Grammy like, this will be my first Grammy. Were you referencing, like, is there a different posthumous kind I mean, of release I mean, I, song that gets a Grammy? I mean, I was, I mean, I was thinking of Nipsey Hussle and Rex in the Middle within the last of course you couple, were. Of, couple of years. Child. Yeah, yeah I'm, reading, uh, well, I'm reading the Marathon Don't Stop right now, so I've got him on the mind. Yeah, well, back in back in the '90s, Kyle, there was a, a fella named the Notorious B.I.G. I, I know who Biggie is, Mike. I don't know enough. And, I don't know as much as I should. Admit he was I he was, was nominated was a for a guy, posthumous but... Grammy for "Mo Money Mo Problems," which is a fitting song to talk about during this movie. Yeah, fair. And he was nominated. And this could have been a great way to honor Biggie by like giving him a Grammy for this, and instead they gave it to Puff Daddy's tribute song to Biggie. <laughs> oh. The um, I'll be missing you. Which, oh my which, god! Which samples stings? I'll be watching you. I mean, every breath you take. I mean, listen. I mean, fuck. Did we did we really give Puff Daddy the Grammy then, or did we give it to Sting? Because like Sting I mean, came out and performed it on the Grammys. Ooh shit! I'm not kidding. Like he came out and he for the he first sang. time in his life he had thoughts. <laughs> 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 that is savage. I'm, it, the, I'm telling you, the book and the movie just hate McTeague. There's no attempt to be sympathetic to him. And uh, just as, for context again, uh, the money she kept from the meat was 60 cents. He gave her a dollar. She pocketed 60 cents of that, which uh, today would be $16. <laughs> this fucking bitch. <laughs> This, as Anna J would say, spooky bitch. This is this is Tom's <laughs> absolute nightmare right now. I love that her fucking fingers are all bandaged up. Yep. I'm telling you, in the book, they she's like so concerned that she can't make her animals anymore because her fingers are infected. It's grim. They get into it. Oh, there's a burn. It might save you a nickel. Got her. But also, she's not wrong. You're going fishing, dummy. Bring bring the fish home. Well, he's taking the birds with him fishing. That's important. Yeah. Yeah. That that is That is the moment that they're never coming back from. When you know how much he loves these birds, these birds have been like a motif throughout the entire thing. Did the bird? One of the birds is the bird he got as a wedding present, and she says, "Sell them, right?" Yeah, for six dollars. Like that's they're never coming. They're never coming back from that. That's the moment this thing all ends. Is her basically saying, "Sell the birds that mean so much to you that you got as a wedding present, despite the fact that I have all this money." Yeah. Bye. Well, so long. As he's walking out the door, fucking bitch. Just muttering to himself, fucking bitch. To bird's nest on a fucking head. <laughs> Look at her. She thinks she's like, oh, I, I got him this time. <laughs> and then she's going back to the chest. And we're all the. Uh... Yeah. 
and their their god awful little shack because they couldn't have the nice house because she didn't want to touch the money. Smeagol. Smeagol. Slytherin well, star for you. I mean, God, that was close to Gollum, but that was also a little bit meatwad. Oh, that's true. Oh, uh, well, Matt never returned that does, so. <laughs> Trina took that employment over. Oh, my God, that's my favorite part of the movie, because she thinks she's going to just, like, put herself from the boot straps. Little do you know. Yeah, so you know when a woman uh, she uh, she forces her husband out of the house, she uh, she then has to go get some work for herself because you know the, the dizzy broad. And she uh, she ran a good wet man away. You know he we went out, we, we went fishing, and uh, you know she she didn't appreciate that. There's I, another cat. And they said, I dare say this is the only commentary on Eric von Stroheim's greed that necessitates knowing Aqua Teen Hunger Force before viewing. Number one in the hood, G. Listen, this don't matter. None yeah, of this matters. Nice. And with all her gold, she was alone, a solitary, abandoned woman. <clears throat> just, just pouring it out on the bed. You yep. know? Yes, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to sleep on my money. She's just which gonna is, which fully is, which, do the Scrooge McDuck now. What, 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 what's so funny, it's that that's not going to be comfortable. <laughs> if it was paper money, it's like, all right, that's not, like, bad, whatever. You, sl- you lay down on some paper. She's laying down on fucking metal. You degenerate freak yeah I'm talking to you Blondie you're the degenerate freak you little bitch don't you give me the stink eye don't everyone you. wondering he's he's talking to the dog now don't give me the stink eye go away okay so we've got McTeague rummaging through the trash approaching the house probably not gonna end well one would imagine the Leicester Memorial Kindergarten. This is one of those things, though, I think that is so interesting, is that... And I think you did used to get this a lot at the turn of the century, like, people living in poverty. You know, the especially, like, these stories, these very, like, William Faulkner-esque kind of stories of these old women who died in poverty cleaning a house, and then you find out they had, like, a shit ton of money that they just never touched. Well, and if there's one thing that's, uh, that hasn't aged well is that uh, schools have gotten so much safer since then. We have no issues with kindergartens or anything. It's a safe space. Everyone's, everyone's always good there. God, she is so fucking spooky. <laughs> Children of the night. <laughs> what music they make. Can I can I offer a hot take and and people can yell at me if they want? Sure. Please. Um, in terms of like relationship come apart silent movies that made it to the National Film Registry, I prefer Greed to Sunrise, even in its two hour cut. Sure. Oh, I think I I agree with that too. Yeah. Like I feel like Sunrise gets more of the love. Sunrise obviously got the Oscar note. I think it's partly because it was successful in its day, but like. That pops up on a lot more lists, like AFI lists, things like that. Um, Greed is obviously, for as much as it has a reputation for being a great film, I think it's it's definitely not in the same canon conversation that sunshine, uh, sun, sunshine, Sunrise, <laughs> a Song of Two Humans often is, but I, I think this is... Well, it, it gets to the thing I was saying before. It's, this one's too bleak. There's no hope in this movie. It's just all a downward spiral into the depths of hell. I love the way she holds out her hand and shows them the the missing fingers. Mm-hmm. You know what a lesser movie would have done in in this part of the story where he abandons her and she's on her own. They would have made her a prostitute. Yeah, they well that's the thing. It would have been cliche, but instead, 
And that's, I think no, that's, that's the good thing. That's what I'm saying. That's the yeah. good thing about this movie is that it feels more natural. It, it would have been a more movie like decision. Of, oh well, we'll show how far she's fallen. She's being a prostitute. And that's and that's thanks in part to it being so having such fidelity to the novel too. I think. But then that even gets to the novel of just like we're gonna, you know, as whatever critiques people have about well, it. Look at the, the just the shadow through the windows. This is there. There's no doubt where all this is going now. Yeah, just just gorgeous framing. That oh, I'm coming in the doorway. The smoke rising out of the pail. I mean, just the absolute total darkness behind her too. Yeah, this just Merry and then the merry jeez. And the idea of, like, obviously, you know, I, like, this is this perfect, but the fact that he goes, I want that 5,000, and even with the threat of death, she will not give up that 5,000. For what? To do? Look at that. Just the light coming through the windows. That that's how he chooses to frame her murder. The two cops outside. This, this battle in silhouette through two different door frames. Uh, you know what's fucked up? Because Mike hasn't seen this movie I'm about to reference, and it's crazy that... I wouldn't put it past this filmmaker to reference greed in this movie, but Kyle, do you remember in Halloween Ends when Corey fights Michael in the tunnel? Yeah. And it's shot exactly like this? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering. You're absolutely freaking right. I would not have... Because I, I didn't see greed in, but when, before I saw Halloween Ends, so I, I wouldn't have put that together. But watching it now, I'm like, oh, fuck. David Gordon Green just straight up it's like, how do we shoot this scene? Yeah. I know. Let's do the greed thing. Yeah. And it's just like sort of like loosely implied too. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Which, and again, it, not, it's not just a empty uh, reference. Yeah, point. It's, it, it fits. Black for, cat this time. It fits the story at that point of Corey's complete descent. You know what I mean? Absolutely. But again, like to go back to Mike's point saying like, why, like you, even with the threat of death, her life wouldn't change if she gave him nope. the money. She would still be working cleaning the floors of a kindergarten. And it's different if it's like you know you're using the money for something, right? Like you often there's we we often think of this idea of like you know save money for a rainy day, save money for a rainy day. But like there's a certain point where it's like how bad does it have to rain, right? Yeah. People say well save money for a rainy day, and then there'll be a hailstorm outside, and they just you know. They, they won't do anything. That's that's the stuff that really is the undoing here. And I like that even in 1924, when you could pretty much do any crime and just get away with it because, hey, there's no technology that this fucking moron is immediately fingered as the guy who killed her. Washing the blood Wiping off. the blood yeah. off of his... Yeah, that's the other thing. When you dip into Von Stroheim films, like, they are fucking brutal. And not just the ones he directed, the ones he acted in, too. He was in um, a, a World War One propaganda film that I am blanking on the name of now. Um, something with Heaven and Heart, I think. I forget what it is. Anyway, long story short, he plays a German uh, soldier who throws a baby out a window. Oh, whoa. And not Hell in a yeah. title card. Not, oh, well, obviously you get this. The most kind of expressionist shot. But yeah, he just um, hurls a baby out of a window in full view of the camera. <laughs> oh, oh, they do show his name. They showed it on the poster. John Doc McTeague. That's the only time he gets a name. Is John Doc McTeague. Oh, on Christmas Eve. The murder took place on Christmas Eve. I love Marcus's little fucking Roy Rogers get up here. <laughs> like, it's so ill-fitting for him. His, his, you know... 
This goddamn Tom Mix outfit there. Or uh, Gene Autry. I think it was most Gene Autry there. Mm-hmm. And now he looks like fucking uh, Walter but, Houston. Well, that's, you know, it's so funny. Like, the, Treasure of the Sierra Madre is one of the movies that often gets cited as, like, literally lifting shots from this. Because, you know, they if you read about greed, you'll often see people saying, like, well, you know, the one thing that I'm sure I'm added is he makes it take place in Death Valley. That is mostly true. Death Valley does come up in the novel as a setting for this. Um, but in the novel, first off, McTeague has a partner named Cribbins that he goes prospecting with, right? And there's a lot of talk about McTeague becoming a miner again because he has that experience from his youth, right? Before he became a dentist. Uh, Cribbins tells McTeague, oh, there's great, uh, there's some great stuff in Death Valley. If you want to go there and, and mine there. And McTeague stays behind for one reason or another. Um, and that's how Marcus finds him. Uh, Stroheim decided, all right, you know what? They mentioned Death Valley. Let's shoot in Death Valley just because Death Valley looks cool as hell. Right. Yeah. And we'll just set it there instead. Um, there's also an element in the, the novel that's very interesting, which is they give you Marcus's interior monologue and he keeps talking over the sheriff so that the sheriff can never officially deputize him so that he can do whatever he wants to McTeague. So that he's not bound by like, oh, I need to bring him in alive or anything like that. Because he's going out there just absolutely to murder the hell out of him. And to get the money. But, uh, yeah, as I was saying, Treasure of the Sierra Madre is one of the movies that's often cited as like, that is absolutely drawing from this, like, straight up full shots and everything. Oh, yeah. So you know, that is... No, no doubt. I mean, we know the Houstons are an arts family, so I have no doubt Walter took john to see this when he was a kid or john went on his own because walter was busy acting or whatever the fuck but absolutely and this death valley stuff is so effective visually that i always remember this being much more of the movie like when i first saw this back in college um i just remember this stuff standing out to me so much and it's it's like the very last bit of the film You know what the coolest thing about Death Valley is? What's that? Undertaker was born there. Is that real? See, actually, that's it's a kayfabe thing. Oh, that's, I, that's, 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 that that would have ruled Undertaker, hailing from the the depths of Death Valley. Every time he'd come out and just like, where is he actually from? I don't know. Probably like, look it up. Fucking Missouri. <laughs> I need. We need to know before this episode about Eric von Stroheim's greed ends. We should be able to inform the listener where. The Undertaker was Mark born, William Calloway. Yeah, where was Mark William Calloway born? He was born in Houston, Texas. Okay. Blondie, what do you think about this mule on screen right now? We got more sniffs on the mic and another lick, and again. It's back to my face. If it gets much hotter, I don't know. Yeah, so in the novel, there is another person here. Um, with McTeague? Yeah, with McTeague. Like they like they meet in like Death of the Valley? Or like they like meet partner at before? the mine. Yeah, it's this guy Cribbins, who's like a shady character. Um, and they break away, but like there is, you know, McTeague's dirt. And I, I'm certain that uh, I believe in the extended cut, like, Cribbins is also a factor there. I don't think there's much that's actually, like, cut from the novel in what Von Stroheim is doing. And if anything, like, his eight-hour cut was just going to add backstory to these characters. It was like a, you know, the first hour or something would have just been McTeague's background. Which I don't know if we necessarily needed. I mean, maybe we would, I don't know. Oh, this, this, look at that. Even the rattlesnake gets several pages in the novel. This, so this is all, you know, all from the source material. Oh, 
Kyle's looking at us like any of us should be saying anything. Mind you, this is mostly shots of mules and desert reptiles. What uh, do you want us to do, uh, Kyle? Honestly, I just saw God, what a country, and I was just oh, looking at Tom that's true, and that's true. And then was Tom, surprised that Tom frequently saying we used to be a country on the podcast. No, I thought you were looking at me like you wanted us to do voiceover of the desert animals, like it was a like a nature documentary from the fifties. Well, I didn't know I wanted that until you said it. So yeah, go ahead. So the rattlesnake seeks out its prey. The Texas rattlesnake, Stone Cold Steve Olsen, <laughs> has just arrived with a steel chair to take out McTeague. <laughs> this is this is a fantastic ending, by the way. Like when you think about it, you know, just we've got no water. We're handcuffed together. Like what a nightmare. Oh yeah, I mean, and especially because it's so. Spoilers for anybody watching this for the first time who doesn't know how it ultimately concludes. But it's like so out of left field that it ends in the <sighs> desert. <laughs> yeah, but it's natural. You know, it fits. Like, oh, this fucking idiot's trying to run, and he ends up because he's a moron. Ends up in the worst. Well, place and because to hide. Marcus is also a moron, which I think is super important. Yeah. This is the longest I think we've gone without talking as because this ending does kind of rule. And I think it is also because it's kind of a Western and we enjoy that, you know. Yeah, nothing wrong with the little... Uh... Oh, see, there we go. Like hell I will, I ain't sworn in. I'll do as I please. I'll do as I please. Fuck you! <laughs> Why is that not a factor in, in more West? That seems like a great twist at the end of a Western. It's just like, oh yeah, I don't have a badge, so I can do what I want. I think because the Westerns never really got into the fact that the, sh you know, the law shouldn't be just shooting everybody. They just unless shoot it's like everyone. full on the Oxbow incident, where that's just what it's about. Yeah, a great fucking movie. I love the, the uh, oh, Oxbow. You know what's the fucking craziest thing too is that I, when I, I watched the Oxbow incident for the first time this year, and then I got up to uh, the pure cinema podcast because uh, i'm behind on everything it was their uh discoveries of 2021 and quentin and roger avery were on it because it's mm -hmm. yeah, yeah the new beverly show quentin shows up every now and then and one of his discoveries of 2021 was the oxbow incident and i was like oh wow quentin you never saw the oxbow incident mcteague was headed for the very heart of death alley that horrible wilderness of which even beasts were afraid which knowing von stroheim he's absolutely saying that to let you know mcteague is a beast that he's less than a beast. Yeah. That sun going down. Oh, man. We, we could hear Blondie's feet clacking on the kitchen floor yep. on Mike, and I wish it had come like five seconds later so it would sync up with the mule's uh, hoofs. As Blondie takes a drink, <laughs> drink of water. Drink of water, which they do not have. While yeah. these fucks are uh, desperate for water. See, Blondie, you're contributing. You're a good girl, but you're also a bitch, and I love you. Also, no spoilers, but there is a good running bit in Guardians 3 about a dog being called a bad girl. You take that back. You'll I'll take get the to bit it. I'm going gonna, gonna to get to it. I'm going to... we got to find time. We're doing... Excellent. Maybe, it's, it's, maybe tomorrow. It's pretty, it's pretty good. I'm sure it is. I have no doubt about it. Like, I'm going to enjoy myself. You, you, you said that so s s creepily. It sounded like you were about to watch that. the same movie Paul Rubens did. I'm going to enjoy I'm myself. Just, I'm, just, I'm truly just trying to be close enough to the mic to be heard. I'm gonna enjoy my, voice is, my, my voice is, is shot to shit lately. Like, I've noticed it listening back to more recent episodes we recorded, like... Listening to a season one episode, I have such a full voice, and now it just sounds like gravel. Yeah, well, we, uh, we're we using it far more than we did two years ago, so. Well, it's also. Yeah, well, like society's back and shit. Well, so. and also just like my, you know, I'm getting my procedure done. I'll hopefully be breathing better soon. Or again, maybe I don't make it. And again, this is maybe my I, last. I, I don't know why you keep throwing it out. We win. Yeah, I mean. Fucking. <laughs> 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 <God>. <laughs> I 
All right, I got three breaks during this uh, episode. I even got Kyle involved. Kyle involved in one. This is a su- successful episode for Tommy. I, I imagine something does go awry in the hospital, that's, and that's there's a new there's a new text chain, a la the Mister Smith goes to Washington episode of Kyle texting Tom, going, "We maybe need to push this back a bit. You say some things." It's gonna be more more behind closed doors. Me talking to my therapist, going, "Listen, so now I have two weeks to laugh at the fact that the thing that we were predicting actually <laughs> happened, and then it's gonna be years of grief." Oh, oh, watch like, out! Watch out! Oh, careful, girl. Bloody. Bonnie, you can't. Okay. Bonnie We're desperately done, wants Bonnie. It's to... so almost over. Don't you worry. Okay, you little munchkin. I love you so much, you little nut. I love you, baby. Ladies, that could be you. I also love but that Marcus is tits. And, but hatred and greed for gold kept Marcus up, and closer and closer he came. Like, just, I do like the idea that, like, they're not. There's no effort by von Stroheim to frame Marcus as doing anything noble, right? Oh yeah. That yeah. it's not like, well, he had to avenge. She's like, no, he's hatred and greed. Even though, by you know, like by the, most I like people, that he thinks age. this is an effective tactic. <laughs> <laughs> as if he's like crawling up a hill. No, you're in. You're in the fucking Stop. wide open plains of Death Valley, you moron. <laughs> he's wearing the pants that give him twenty percent. Well, that's increased that, in sneaks. So by the way, in the it. novel, there's a great bit uh, a little later where Marcus uh, is debating, like, do I go after the mule or do I stay with McTeague? Because what if McTeague runs away? And he's like, "There's no way to run away out here. You can see anything. It's mm-hmm. Death Valley. If he runs, I'll spot him." Marcus has never worked out a day in his life. <laughs> well, that is kind of the fun of Marcus. He is a fraud. Yeah, he is. He's, he's a punk. absolutely a fraud. He's a punk. I mean, why would I bring it with me in the middle of a desert? Well, I no, mean, he has it because he's running away. That's the only thing. He's just a fugitive, and he's got it on he's, the mule. He's got it. He's... But the mule got into that, uh, what are they called? They're going to say it later. It's the type of weed that it gets into that makes it go crazy. The Pineapple Express. <laughs> <laughs> Number four. This is, it's, we're getting tired. Speak for yourself, punk. Yeah, what do they say? It's some kind of. In the novel, they talk about it a lot, like the, the whatever the the thing it eats that makes the donkey go nuts. Loco weed. That's oh, of what it course. Was. Uh, he ate some loco weed. Obviously. Which is Depends also off. how Kyle produces most of our episodes. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yeah. If I could get a uh, if I could get a sponsor, that'd be great. Looking at you, sauce essentials. Loco weed sound. Loco weed sounds like one of those fake weed stores around Times Square. Oh, 100 percent. Yep. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That like loving. you see tourists go into and it's, it's, get it, mad that they paid too much money. It feels okay. like something you uh, like our aunts or uncles would call uh, weed laced with fentanyl. <laughs> Ooh, yep. Some of that loco weed. That I do love that that he shoots through the water. Yep. Just, they are so fucked. Hmm. We are dead. Like, th- just... That is that is how a Von Stroheim movie is going to end, is everyone is just fucked. I have yet to... Like, Blind Husbands ends positively, but it, that's the only one of his films I've seen where it's like, oh, good, these people are better than they were before. And even then, it's they're better than they were before because one of them had an affair. Hmm. 
even if we're done for, I'll take some of my truck along. Yeah, listen, I mean. I love that. I ain't so sure about who the money belongs to. As though, even now, Marcus yeah. still thinks he's entitled to the money. Like, what to to what end? She's dead. You left. What What else is there to gain from this? I mean, I mean, is it the, a last attempt to gain meaning in a meaningless scenario? I don't know. That there's not even a moment of clarity, and we're gonna die. He still thinks like it matters. Well, I mean, maybe it's better to just double down than to admit that you know. At the end is nigh. And then we get an incredible shot like this. Which echoes, if we had gotten the wrestling scene in, you know, that's in the longer cut, like this echoes that fully. And the other thing I love about that, that shot of, of Marcus on the ground is that you kind of don't know, is that blood coming out of his head or is that the water that got shot out of the canteen? Yeah. Right? Like, that's such a clever visual. But then, for as much as a dumbass that Marcus is, he gets one up on him. Yeah? Yes. That is... Ugh. You, ain't going on, you ain't going anywhere, punk. That That really is one of those things. We talk about this sometimes with films where, like, even if you're not totally sold on it before the end, the ending just mm. lands so well mm -hmm. that you can't argue with it. This is absolutely one of those. Where, like, it, it sticks the landing so good that you can't help but walk out of this thing being like, oh, great, great picture. Yep. And, uh, I think with that... We have reached the end of our journey. Yeah, we got dead mule there. We got dead Marcus and McTeague relatively hopeless. Well, I mean, it's entirely hopeless. I don't know why I said relatively. I don't, there's no way out of this one. What, well, there's in no, relation there's to no being sequel? he's still alive and is probably going to die as compared to, well, he's in a wood chipper now. No, true, true. And at least he's got all that gold in a bag. So that'd be pretty helpful. Yeah, he's, you know, he, can, he can eat the gold. That's a hearty source of fiber. I mean, edible gold is a thing. Just ask a million YouTube videos. You know what? What if I, what if I, in the YouTube video, just drop a card for like one of those influencers eating edible gold at this point in the film? Oh, and we return once again to the bird motif. Pull bugs. He tries to grab the bird. And it is dead. It's like poetry, it rhymes. Right? I mean, that is that that is kind of the master trick of this. Is even with hours cut out of it, him just throwing the bird away like he refused to at the beginning. Just... And then just accepting his fate. And the blood-stained money. So, with this... We have come to the end. We have. Uh, normally, I would say, Tom, how do you think this did at the Academy Awards? But it's 1924. There were no Academy Awards. So... Zero. It didn't do anything. Um, so, with that, I guess there's only one thing for us to do. Um, Kyle, uh, first off, let me just say, folks, before we do that, uh, thank you so much for joining us for our first ever commentary track if you joined us for the whole thing quite frankly some folks might have tapped out uh yeah, who knows you. you know long movie long track but if you did join us uh please let us know what you thought of this we're gonna try and do more of these if you guys like it if you hate it we won't 
Um, or maybe we still will if you're not vocal enough about it. So, without further ado... It's time for our registry picks. A reminder to our listeners, or if this is your first time listening, uh, it needs to be an American film uh, that's at least 10 years old in order to qualify to be in the registry. So, uh, what are you guys picking today? Uh, I'm going to go first. So, um... <clears throat> I'm going with the angle of the missing footage thing, and my pick is... Yeah, Mike knew exactly what I'm going with. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going with Once Upon a Time in America. Uh, one, because it's after this and Magnificent Ambitions, it's probably the most f infamous case of a movie being completely butchered and trimmed down from its director's intent. Uh, Sergio Leone, one of my favorite directors of all time directed the good the band the ugly my favorite movie uh came to america took took him forever to get a movie made and he landed on this it's supposed to be this what four or five hour epic about uh jewish gangsters there as kids and then as they are older and all of that and a studio said no no this will not be this long you are going to cut it down to around two hours and it's going to be uh, in linear order instead of the flashback structure Leone uh, intended. And uh, the movie was re uh, received uh, like a knife to the dick. Nobody was a, a, a fan of that cut. Uh, but word got around because it's screened in its original cut at uh, Con, I think. A uh, few screenings in like Canada... I know, I know for a fact my father managed to see the original cut in theaters in Manhattan somehow. So I know someone must have got an original cut in America somewhere. But it was this uh, holy grail for a while. And it actually finally got uh, the uh, three and a half hour cut on home video. And then uh, a restoration uh, search was led by Martin Scorsese and his uh, group. And they got an even longer cut, as close as they can possibly get to Sergio's original intent. And it's an amazing movie. And even if it wasn't the best movie in the world or whatever, which it's not, it's not Leone's best, but it's still a fantastic movie. I think just for what Leone's done for cinema at large, you uh, to be able to put a Leone in the registry, the only one you can, you kind of have to do it. And uh, yeah, it's and it's also fucking bleak as hell, like. Not like greed. It's it, it, it is not very uh does not look kindly upon humanity. So uh I think in multiple regards, uh Once Upon a Time in America is a perfect addition to the registry that would pair up well with greed. It would be a long double feature, but uh, I think it works. To that degree where Tom's mentioning things uh Tom's mentioning things that attach that are connected to the film but are also outside the film. He's talking about the missing footage I'm thinking about some of those storylines that kind of reflect on one another and the way that things unfold. Um, when I was thinking about this film, uh, aside from I also thought of one, Once Upon a Time in America, so I had a feeling Tom was going that way, but I was also thinking about another film that, while it's not about greed per se, it is about relationships and the wheels coming off of relationships and the, the chaos that kind of comes from that. Um, a film that has two storylines, one... Uh, murderous and the other much more uh, I don't know low key amorous but both of which you get to watch the wheels kind of come off for some, some men and women involved um, and it's it's one of this filmmaker's best films it's one of those ones where like even amidst all of the personal scandal and all of the conversation and people who go I really don't like this guy like that film's pretty good um, which is Crimes and Misdemeanors I think Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors is one of those films that, like, even people who don't like Woody Allen films or don't like Woody Allen or don't like that, that film hits because it really does just get to the heart of where things can go awry in relationships and, and, and the the lengths to which people go and the, the crimes and well, crimes and misdemeanors to which passion will drive us. So uh, I think Crimes and Misdemeanors absolutely uh, needs to be in the National Film Registry. It's one of the darker Alan films, but also one of the best. Jer incredible Jerry Orbach performance, Alan Alda. Um, just an a all-around great cast, great performances that really does try and take... I, I think in the same way that Von Stroheim's Greed offers a criticism of that time in America, so too Crimes and Misdemeanors taps into its era in a really smart and clever way. So, Crimes and Misdemeanors. 